looked at some of the finances and some of the items that uh, involve what we spend as a village. But I think if we dive deeper into Paul's, now I'm skipping ahead of your agenda here, Chair, if you want to move no, other no, items up. No, we're okay. Well, yeah, I am. Um, well, I, I have a couple of items here, but uh, I really, really would really like to get to the uh, presentation by, for, for Paul. I okay. I'd like to just skip around and a couple of thought that and get get that going because everybody's here basically to hear you and, and, and what the what the progress okay. is on the lake. So okay. uh, so I will... Uh, and we can bring those back up later. Yes, we'll bring them back up later. Your presentation? Yes. <coughs> You know, while we're doing that, and while Paul is doing that, maybe without uh, stepping on anybody's toes in this situation, but your board, uh, the water management board, what we're done by, is, what we're required to do, and in, in our mission, if you would, is uh, right. to, to manage the lake in uh, maybe more of a holistic way. We, I mean, there are species of fish that we need to protect. There's oxygen generating plants that we need to look at. There's natives, there's non-natives. And this lake, as Paul, I think, is going to show, uh, was generated from a pothole condition in marsh. So we have a probably, I would say, 60% of our current lake is literally farmland that's been flooded over. And that farmland is the littorial area. So, Paul, why don't you take? I, I saw that's going to be some of the direction yes. of the slide. So oh, you can can everybody hear me? All right. Are here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I want to thank everybody first for coming out tonight on a hot early fall day. <laughs> um, we took a look at the lake today. Um, I want to give some just brief anecdotal stuff from today. I um, haven't had a chance to really look at that process, that data yet for today. There will be no more treatments this year. We did talk a little bit maybe about some touch-up harvesting still, but that's been kind of the policy of the Water Board not to do treatments after Labor Day. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on on the lake. But I wanted to kind of, as uh, John alluded to, go over you know, in general, what aquatic plant management involves. Um, first of all, I mean, we're not trying to create a situation where it's like a swimming pool out there. It is a lake, although it is unnatural in the sense that it was man-made. There were existing lakes there prior, which I'll show you in a minute. But um, when the dam was built back in the 1920s, it raised the water level approximately six feet so all the areas that was around these small lakes and ponds was basically raised up and they became one larger lake. So as John mentioned, when you flood areas that are formerly what we call um, upland, they will have a different characteristic than a lake that was carved out by the glaciers, which all the natural lakes in the area will have a different type of formation and different type of plant and uh, pro productivity because of that. Um, so one of the things this slide kind of shows the different um, basically jobs that aquatic plants do in the ecology, the functions that they um, provide to not only the water quality but also to the fish and the water the wildlife including the insects that are in the lake. One of the things people kind of forget about is the small aquatic insects. That's the base of the food chain for any lake. If you do not have those, or if you have a very, um, you know, lack of diversity in your insects, you are going to have um, a poor quality in the ecology of the lake. So, the more types of plants you have, the more habitat you have. And I'm talking about natural plants, not invasive plants, the better quality you're going to have from an ecological standpoint. And I know not all of you took ecology in high school or college, but um, it is important from a sustainability standpoint of the lake, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the history of Wolverine Lake I kind of alluded to before, we created this um, graphic 
Um, we found, which was really curious, we found a USGS map. Usually you don't find them earlier than about 1920, but we found one from 1907. So this preceded the, um, the dam being built. And you can see that there was a series of lakes. I don't know if this has a, I'm just gonna point it out, but Penny Lake, which is almost referred to as this whole arm, was actually just a small little pond down here. And Commerce Road used to go right through that section. And you can see these little symbols down here that kind of looks like grass, those are wetland symbols. So this area all along in here which is now, I think, Wolverine Drive, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, was all wetland. Wetland has very fertile soils. Um, so it grows a lot of good things. Same thing up in here on the, the west side of Penny Arm and then down at the west end of the lake, this was all wetland. There was a larger lake called Spring Lake. And it's interesting, the elevation there is shown at 912. Well, the elevation at the current elevation of the lake is around 918, so at, and hence it was raised about six feet. <coughs> so um, you can see there was basically little streams that connected all these lakes, and they eventually went out into the, the outlet there. I don't know. Does that have a name? The outlet? I couldn't find that on. Uh. Not that I know of, but it's where it heads into <laughs> Commerce Lake, where a headwater yeah, of it uh, goes into Commerce, the Huron yeah. River. So. so this is from the 1907 USGS topographical map. Well, what's the drainage on there, um, Paul, if I'm not mistaken, our watershed? Gee, we, we studied that together, John. It's about 1,300 acres. About 1,300 acres, okay. That comes so, into our lake. Yeah, so that's about five times the size of the lake. Yeah. And so this is the DNR map that was created back in 1947. Um, and you can see the ponds basically show up real good um, where the deep basins are. This one of the things that's interesting from this map is you don't see any of the channels. You know, the channels that were dug over here and this section here, which it was really Oak Peninsula back then, not Oak Island because it was all connected. Um, so you can kind of see how the lake has evolved over time. The other thing that when you dig these man-made channels, they're like built, basically building an aquarium in the lake, provides excellent habitat for growing plants. So those, those channels, specifically the man-made channels, are always difficult to manage. They require a lot of management just to make them basically have navigation, be able to navigate them. They're usually shallow usually full of weeds, so you have to spend a lot of time and effort just to keep those open. So, and then this, this year we created a new depth contour map of the lake. We actually used uh, hydroacoustic, high definition hydroacoustic mapping, where we had a, a person from our office spend a day out at the lake, and we did one in the spring and one in the, later in the year, and I'm gonna show those different maps that relate to that later, but this map was created from the late season um, hydroacoustic uh, survey that was done. And it basically is not greatly different. There are subtle differences between the um, map that the DNR created in 1947. So basically what it's showing is the lake hasn't gotten significant, significantly shallower in the deep basins. Now the, the near shore areas, you know, I'm sure there's areas that have built up with silt, but it seems like in the deep basin, we're not seeing great differences between the 1947 map and this one. So just to give a summary of aquatic plant control, I'm just gonna basically hit the highlights. We talked about this at last, uh, winter um, was doing something different, specifically in Penny Arm, where we had a lot of complaints last year at this time. And we tried another area to the Ang Angola Briar Ridge. We were using a different herbicide. It's a granular form of fluoridone, which is called Sonar 1. 
Um, it's never was never used in Michigan prior to this year. It was tried on Wolverine Lake, Lake Oakland, Pontiac Lake, and White Lake. So those were the only four lakes in this area that got treated um, with this particular um, herbicide. Um, we had a very mild winter this year, especially compared to the previous two winters that we had before this. That really plays a big role, especially if you have a shallow lake. Um, what it allows is when you have minimum amount of ice cover and a lot of these plants are, have portions of the plant still viable underneath the ice and if the conditions are right, whether it be sunlight can get through the ice or there's no ice at all, they'll start growing. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute, one of these, um, these images that we have from the early season hydroacoustic that was really gonna show you what that, what that does. What that limited ice cover, early ice off, the ice was off in early March this year, whereas in the previous year it didn't go off till middle of April. So that's basically about six weeks head start that these plants got for growing. And the milfoil in particular, which is, that's a non-native invasive plant, and it is a perennial plant, meaning it doesn't die in the winter. It's there the whole year round and it can grow if the conditions are right. Um, we also, through the um, Sonar One, which I mentioned, we had to get a special permit from NDQ for that. We went through the process of submitting all that extra information that they required for this particular herbicide. And we had all that submitted back in February but the permit was not issued until May 15th, which was very important because, as I mentioned earlier, those plants got a six-week head start, and then we were delayed by this permit, which typically these fluoridone permits are issued on April 1st. So in a typical year, if we'd have got that permit on April 1st, we could have applied the herbicides in a normal time frame, and particularly in penny arm, I think things would have gone a lot better. We also did the first treatment on May 16th, so as soon as we got that permit, we put it in the water. We also, that's about the normal time to do the, the other more conventional herbicides that we use. So they treated the entire lake on May 16th, basically. Paul, um, I know we're sort of breaking some rules. I was just talking to the chair. Um, I think the board might ask some questions. Would it be possible for us to maybe interrupt yep. you where it yep. makes some sense? Maybe that'll answer questions yep. out here. I was with Paul today. You mentioned four lakes, and you mentioned them today for the first mm -hmm. time that use sonar. Right. Uh, or were allowed to use sonar. Does yes. that mean there was a parallel problem in those lakes? As there were we in did? some of them. Um, okay. Lake Oakland and Pontiac Lake, the plants weren't as far along. So the timing didn't affect them as much. I guess mm -hmm. White Lake had an issue where it was similar to what we experienced on Penny Arm. Okay. Because okay. these treatments all happened around the same time because of the delay in the and, permit. And sonar itself um, was used in Pontiac Lake once, I think, of members of the community that remember sonar used in this lake. It somewhat created what was called a ghost lake. Right, when, uh, when, when sonar first came out, it was <coughs> intended to be used on hydrilla in Florida, which is a very um, tough plant to control. They were, the label rate, what they had in the label was 150 parts per billion. What is now allowed in Michigan with the liquid treatments is six parts per billion, so that kind of gives you an idea of but they didn't really know what they were doing when they first started applying these in Michigan. They didn't know what was going to happen. And a lot of those treatments initially were put in at like 20, 25 parts per billion. And it was killing almost everything in the lake. And that's, yeah, that's not good, as I mentioned before. And so, yeah, there were definitely some bad experiences. They have refined it a lot since then. The granular. Um, was applied at a theoretical rate of 25 parts per billion, the first treatment. However, what they measured in the water was never above five parts per billion. So it never got high enough to cause damage to any other plants. Other and then the finally, that, that multiple application, which I think we all were affected by, was really the reason why we as a community 
kept getting knocked down from being irrigated. Is that correct? correct. And the reason is because <coughs> what's required by law is a 30-day irrigation restriction for lawns. Um, um, or when it's applied, as I mentioned at the theoretical, it's above 10 part per billion applied, so they had to post that 30 day. But the first time you sample it after that, you know, like I said, we never had anything above five part per billion. So it's automatically released as soon as you get the sample back, or the results back. The problem is it takes, you have to overnight them down to North Carolina where their lab is, and there's a delay. And early in the season when they're running a high volume of these samples, I think that's where we ran into the problem where it was taking like seven to ten get days to get results when normally it, it's turned around two or three days. So I think the second, the bump up wasn't nearly as bad as that initial one when it was uh, 30, it was almost, I think it went 18 days, is that what the, mm -hmm. the total was on the first one? So the native plant growth um, on the lake was somewhat delayed and the reason that is is because native plants typically don't grow as, as early in the season as these uh, invasive ones and that's one of the advantages that the invasive plants have. They get started before the other plants so they have limited competition at that time. Obviously the native plants once they did come on came on very strong. Um, especially NIAD, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. The other one was celery, which isn't really new. Been around for two or three years where it's been a problem. Sonar one was successful. We looked in those areas today. Uh, for penny arm, there was no millful at all. The other area where there was more water exchange, we're seeing still some milfoil. It was practically dead, but it was still there. Um, and the penny arm, which is more um, secluded from the rest of the lake and doesn't get the, the uh, water exchange, it, uh, the concentration stuck very good in there, so we get good results in there. Uh, Paul, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, now the sonar, won't we see a residual effect of that in the next couple yes. of years? So like this- Next year. All the stuff that we went through this year with the water restrictions and all that, we're gonna see benefits from that. Right, and those areas that we use, correct? sonar one, particular penny arm, we should be able to harvest from the get-go. In there because there should be no milfoil and the reason we can't harvest milfoil is because it it reproduces by vegetatively by cuttings basically if any of you ever grew geraniums if you cut a geranium part of a geranium off the planet it'll grow on its own same thing with milfoil if you cut pieces of it off it'll float around sink to the bottom and start growing again um, so that kind of limits what we can do with the harvesting too. But like like Tony mentioned, in those areas that we did sonar one, theoretically there's going to be no milfoil in there, so we can go in there and harvest from the get-go. Starry stonework growth was extensive in portions of the lake, including penny arm, and that's where we saw some heavy growth of it this year. But that's the sonar does not affect starry stonework at all. We were allowed to treat um, with certain sides in there, but not the ones that were the most effective. The other um, reason we had some issues, particularly with celery this year, were with Comine Crystal, which is a relatively new product, it's been around for about two or three years. We found it very effective at celery, but the only, only thing that has much effect on celery is a chelated copper product. It's a granular, it's kind of a slow release, and it targets the base of the plant where most of the biomass is and if you can get it early enough before it shins up that little flower, it can really stunt the growth of, of the, the celery. We anticipated using more of that this year. They had a problem with the um, formulation of combing crystal. They basically pulled all their product and so it was available to nobody this year after about July or June 30. So we were able to use a very small amount of it, but not nearly as much as we anticipated. Um, Eurasian milfoil, just a brief summary. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. And basically, you, you most likely have hybrid milfoil in your lake, not, not Eurasian. It hybridizes with the native milfoil, and it's harder to kill than Eurasian. Most 
lakes that have Eurasian are fairly easy to kill. Eurasian milfoil um, is the hybrid milfoil, which is a cross between the native and the Eurasian. That's a little bit harder to kill. And this is um, what it looks like underwater. Curly pondweed, the early season plant. A lot of this in penny arm this year, early in the year, is affected by sonar, and that went down pretty fast once it um, took effect. And starry stonework. Um, this is a fairly new. I think you guys have probably had it for what about eight, ten years now. Yeah. So. Um, and I think everybody here probably knows what it is. It, it looks like a, a Brillo pad, a carpet of Brillo pad, basically, on the bottom, and it out competes almost anything in the water. It out competes even lily pads. Um, so very hard to control. Yeah. This area here is on a lake in southern Michigan and uh, where the boat is is normally six foot deep. And you can see that the star is almost up to the surface there. So it's a problem in a lot of lakes and they're doing research on it right now but right now about the only thing you can do is throw copper at it continually. Um, we've done some early season treatments with clipper um, which have been fairly effective, but it is expensive to do that. And you can only basically do smaller areas. Um, so you can harvest it. Um, it's not easy to harvest, but you can harvest it. Um, we found that a combination of harvesting and treatments seems to work best. I was talking to Nathan and John today that we had a couple lakes in northern Oakland County that are much smaller, but we've been able to basically reduce it from 100% of the literal zone down to about 10%. So it is possible to get it, but it takes several years of, of intensive management to get it down. Um, I think the secret is to get it early, hard and heavy early. This and that's is what in our, sorry to interrupt, but that's in our plan or? Yes, it's, yep, that's in our plan, especially penny arm. You know, we had some restrictions this year because of that evaluation treatment but next year we won't have those in any harm so we can do basically so we won't be limited on the harvest uh, on the nope. harvester operation we won't be limited the on treatments. the treatments we're limited on some of the treatments use. too um so this in my left hand is care which is a native macroalgae generally considered be beneficial it provides good ground cover it's only about three to six inches tall and it keeps the sediment from getting stirred up when boats go through, um, which um, Starry does that too, but it basically is care on steroids. It grows. Oh, grows real tall. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not used to using a microphone. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. And it's so, it's so recent that there weren't even line drawings of this. So I basically had to do that myself. <laughs> That's my artwork there with the, but basically that um, the bowl bowl or that little white star is what is the reproductive structure of the plant. And it, those are generally produced in the spring. Um, so if you can get it early enough when it first comes up, it can be effective. Um, Illinois pondweed is one that's quite prevalent throughout the lake, pretty common this year. It seemed like it's doing better this year, probably because of the weather. Um, it can grow as dense as this. Typically, it's more sparse than this, but obviously it can grow denser than that. Um, this was from a lake not too far away, Woodhull Lake, um, part of the Clinton R River system. But it is fairly easy to harvest. So when we have nuisance levels of this plant, we typically harvest it. That's what the drawing of that plant looks like. Wild celery, this is one we were talking about before. This is, right now, this is the biggest problem on the lake. If you were to go out there right now, wild celery. And it's not so much even the, the leaves of the plant itself, when they're growing, aren't so much the problem. It's the flower that comes up. It's got a little white flower with a spirally stalk. That's what everybody catches on their motor, the prop, or it's sucked into their wave runner. So that's what causes all the problem. The other problem is, it's very, in fact, the DNR planted this plant back in the 60s in a lot of lakes because it was such a highly valued um, 
food source for migratory waterfowl because they eat the rhizomes or the runners are very high in carbohydrates and they target those. They don't eat the rest of the plants, so they'll, you'll see swans and geese and ducks dabbling down there to grab them out and they just let it float around. So it's not even just what gets cut up by propellers and stuff, it's also ducks and geese and swans are also uprooting the plant. So that's how it spreads to um, by the seeds moving around. Um, it can, like I said, combing crystals seems to do the best on this plant. You can harvest it, it's not easy again because it breaks loose so easy, but you can harvest it. So is that combing crystal available next year? Supposed to be. It was it's supposed to be available later this year. It never Right, so never if it's was. not available this year and for whatever reason not available next year, what's the... There is another granular product that was unavailable because they were bombarded. <laughs> it's another manufacturer. It doesn't work quite as well, but it, 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 it's called a harpoon granular. It was by their competitor, basically. But they didn't have enough of that either. Um, so we, yeah, we can, if we can anticipate it, yeah, we can have uh, Steve purchase some more of the harpoon granular. But um, I'm meeting with the guy from CPRO, the representative that makes that tomorrow, so I should have a better idea after that meeting. That's one of the things on my agenda. Large leaf pondweed is another um, native plant. This is one that's really beneficial for fish. And the reason is because not only is it really good cover, I don't know if all you guys are fishermen, but it's good cover for both predator and, and prey fish. And it also, you can see the size of the leaf, provides really good habitat for those invertebrates or those water bugs that are in the water. And so you'll, I found leaves where you'll see four or five different species of, of aquatic insects on the one leaf. And what that is, that's the base, again, the base of the food chain. So if you have a fair amount of that in the lake, you're going to have, most likely, going to have a healthy fishery. It does flower once during the season, so you can harvest it too. This is the one that was really prevalent this year. It's really hard to predict when this is going to take off. Um, apparently, it likes hot or warm, hot summers, <laughs> or warm water and hot summers because really went gangbusters this year. Um, it's kind of a low bushy thing, but if you're in shallow, wa shallow water, you know, it's three or four, three feet tall probably can cause problems. So you can treat it with um, herbicide, you can harvest it. So you either it came, it typically is a later season plant, comes on late July, early August. So that's when it really starts. I think the North Shore had a ton of this in the very west end. It was all the way up to the surface at the west end. So and what do we do to treat that? Since that's can, new and unexpected. Yeah, we did treat treat it this year, but um, you're limited because it's a native plant on how far out you can go from shore. Like I said, you can harvest it too. It actually harvests up pretty good. Okay. Paul, can you make any comments? You, you talk about limited and I know being in and out of the board for 14, 15, maybe 16 years. Um, when I first got on, it was a little bit new to me to know that we don't own the lake. Uh, you know, as a villager who was sitting there with 600 feet, you'd like to think, okay, so I'm, I've got some water out there, but uh, it's all state controlled under a 1954 right. you, act. You own the bottom land. The bottom land. Which so are basically a pie that. shaped from your property lines out to the middle of the lake. Um, what gives the village authority is they have what's called public works authority <coughs> over the water or over the bottom lands. Mm -hmm. And it's different in different states. In Michigan, the riparian law is that the, the lakefront owners own the bottom lands. The state owns the water. It's called waters of the state. So that's why you have to get a permit. You have to get a permit from the state apply anything to the waters of the state. So there's a bunch of different rules for that. The ones that are important are for native plants, you're only allowed to treat 100 feet of frontage per, prop per property. So if you have a large 
frontage, you can only treat 100 feet of it, and you're only allowed to go out to the five foot contour or 300 feet, whichever comes first. So there's areas of the lake that we can't treat at all because they're either undeveloped, I mean, talking about for native plants, they're either undeveloped or they're more than 300 feet or five foot contour from shore. But that doesn't affect us rarely, right? Right. It's There's very few. It's very few, but I'm just saying it's we don't have carte blanche. And there's limitations on the amount of herbicides that you can put in. Well, there's a time limit between treatments and there's also a dose limit. So the, the DEQ puts all these rules in place. Sometimes if you if you really are bored, you can go to the DQ website <laughs> and see all those rules. But I did, I did want to show you the Sonar 1 evaluation. This was a map that was created to go along with that. We did today, we went out and did the late season um, survey of all those points to see what was growing at all those points. On the control area, which apparently I didn't make clear enough <laughs> earlier no, Just a question on this, that area. This area, of, I don't know if any of you are familiar with scientific research, but control basically means you don't do anything there. It's a, it's a control, so we didn't do any treatments in this area, so what John was saying, there were some people complaining about that area of the lake, and we probably should have made it clear that this area was not treated at all. So there is milfoil growing in there right now. There's also, it's mostly actually naiad growing in there, but I think, um, most people probably don't take power boats through there, but uh, I think a lot of people may take kayaks or paddle boards. Actually, there, so. there is a decent amount. Of is there people that power boat? Yeah. And that's one of the areas that you know we next year we can we can treat it. So okay. we'll take care of it. And that was where I was actually focusing on that NIAD. Make sure that we do because we have a quite a few residents. Yep. And for clarity to the board, I or from the board, I don't live over there. I'm actually quite far from there. Um, but when I go over in that area, that naiad is, I mean, yeah, I big. joke with them, it's you have some nice bushes under the water, <laughs> right? they're huge. Mm -hmm. And they're right up against their docks and, and uh, hoists. Right, we did treat like the north shore along there. But yeah, it, it's, I mean, it took multiple treatments in there. And the naiad will be under control for those residents? Yes. Yeah, anywhere there where there was docks or anything, we treat it, right? So I mean, anywhere anybody's boat has where we try to do the, the test area you're talking yeah. about is all over yeah, that gonna, section that I'm nobody's there. I'm going to show there. the treatment maps too. So, we so can. if there was a problem with navigating successful. Right, because that, that NIAD's pretty plentiful down there. I I was very confused what it was until actually seeing that explanation because I've gone back and forth with John trying to figure out what it actually was. Yeah, that, that probably was my fault for not making that more clear back in, was it March? I met with you guys yeah. in February one of those. Um, this is the treatment map from uh, basically the treatment on May 16. The survey was done a couple weeks before that. But all these, this was the sonar one areas, was these kind of metallic green. And then some of the other areas that we treated. And you can see that it was a fairly, that first treatment, because of the mild winter, was by far more than we had done in the past couple two or three years in that first treatment. Um, and the only area, you know, there also is that setback from the dam, which is, most people might be aware of, but there's a 300 foot setback from the dam. That we, so there's probably two or three houses from the dam that don't ever get treated, in theory. Now the reality is there's drift, so it does go in there, but uh, they don't actually get treatment. Those so maps, by the way, are on our website. Right. So each new map for either treatment or harvesting is posted when we get them from Paul. Right. And the other you thing see we, where it's going to be treated the other, and harvested. The other thing we talked about was the communication that might improve that as far as knowing when the treatments are going to, yes. that we are going to put on the website next year pending board approval, like the, um, dates that we, because we know pretty much when we're going to do our surveys ahead of time. This year we did them every three weeks. So we pretty much had it set before the season. 
And even though you might know, not know the exact day when that treatment comes because there's other variables that play into that, at least you would know the week we're doing the survey, so then the treatment's probably going to occur the following week from that. And I think just kind of a straw poll is that would that benefit people to know like the week that the treatment is going to occur mm -hmm. anything we can do to get more information in advance is yes I, I think yeah based on the survey we'll, we'll talk about later but next year we're not going to have any of the extended water restrictions <coughs> correct we're not doing like that's a big thing I think you need to right. let the audience right. know is that that sonar treatment we did is the one unique uh, herbicide that requires that extended right. treatment, which is 30 days. Every other product that they use, what's the maximum time? Like four days, I think, for irrigation? Typically three to five days. Yeah, so yeah. three to five days is the most time that we're going to have that restriction. Right. So this was the first harvest map that was created. Or no, this is a treatment map, sorry. This is from the June 2nd treatment. You can see after that big treatment the first time, the only areas we're really treating are mainly for starry stonework down here because the sonar didn't affect the starry stonework, so we had to come back and treat it with a different herbicide. And then there was some algae growth. That's what the that yellow areas are. That was primarily what occurred in early June. And then the harvesting, um, because of the evaluation, we couldn't harvest in penny arm until after the 4th of July. So that's why there's nothing down here right now. Um, and then you can see the other areas of the lake that were targeted at that time. Can you explain a little bit more for the public so I understand how that harvesting part works? So you've gone around, you've done the survey, you've determined that you're gonna do the herbicides in certain areas and then right. you give the map to the harvester yep. operator. And the harvesting, again, is based on what species are there. Um, you, Like I said, you you gotta wait about two or three weeks after a milfoil treatment to be able to go in and harvest it. So this was close enough to that first treatment that we basically couldn't really harvest in any of the milfoil areas. So these areas that I'm showing here are primarily pond weeds that were growing at that time. This is really before celery had started too. So, and then we did another survey just Later. going back what, real quick to oh, that harvesting sorry. map for more clarification, I get a lot of uh, feedback that we pull off the cutter uh, as we go through. Like you'll see the harvester going down and won't be cutting for the entire time. Is there a particular reason why we're, there are definitely weeds in between some of these harvesting areas? Uh, why aren't we cutting those? Um, I think you know it's probably because there weren't enough there to really be causing issue at that point it's kind of what i'm doing when i do that survey is prioritizing the areas that are um that and are the worst areas because they only harvest two days a week and we're doing these surveys every three weeks so if i so were if to we harvest it if three i were days to a week. show the whole shoreline they wouldn't be able to get to all those areas in that amount of time but if we harvested for three days a week, you would recommend that we harvested more areas? We could, yes, if potentially. I'm, I can't guarantee it. It depends on the growth. But, but this year we probably could have. Like for this year, yes, I think we could have. No, that's the but, first I've heard that. Yeah. That really disturbs me to hear that, so you truth. And so the restriction is basically an hour's restriction that either the board or the village has put upon the harvester? Is that what I'm... I don't know what the restriction is. It sounds are. like a perception because from yeah. our end sitting on so that the audience and anybody else knows, we've always been on the premise of utilize as much as possible. Okay, okay we're utilizing as much as possible and uh, and we're getting everything that we're supposed to be getting and we constantly get feedback from from our residents that, that it's not necessarily being uh, utilize as much as possible and they have a lot of issues with their spots then I'll go out which I've started to do quite a bit this year and go through areas that I've suspected in the past and it's still quite thick of, of from now what I have some broad leaf something and then some of the other things I'm still learning of what everything is right but the, that is cut and so but it sounds like the main restriction was a perception of time that was part of it and also like I mentioned you can't treat them 
mill foil areas that have non mill foil areas. This is uh, for for transparency. I live on the main lake side, so uh, this was mostly noticed on the main lake. I got from the penny lake the harvesting aspect. I got very little feedback. It was more we have really bad weeds and it stinks for penny lake. And for the main lake, it was um, we still have areas that have weeds poking through the surface and the harvester already went through, why aren't we cutting those? Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of it, and I, I'm, I don't want to steal the, the, right. the uh, Jeff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, I don't want to you steal his you. thunder, but I think a couple of the board members, or Tony, might have gone along on the harvester. It's not like mowing your lawn where you just see straight, you might know, see clean lines and you're going along and you can easily pick up everything that's there. Right, but hang on a second. My understanding was is that when you gave Jeff the harvester map, that when I went and rode with Jeff and I talked to Jeff and Nathan, my understanding was is that everything you put on that harvester map was kind of getting fulfilled and that there wasn't anything for Jeff to cut and then he was coming back empty half the time. In fact, the time I went and rode with him was like that. So I, I'm kind of confused of, are we saying that there was a limitation put on the harvester couldn't go out enough to cut stuff? Or was the reason that he couldn't cut, my understanding was I thought that when I saw there was weeds, like we were talking about the aquatic plants in an area that wasn't being cut, my understanding was they weren't being cut was because it was either a, a type of plant that you said we couldn't cut, or that there was a chemical application was put it on well and we couldn't do it. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I think we need to be clear, we need to understand. I'm just making general statements. I think by the Mainly, end of you've the never really season. had a non cuttable plant, correct? Oh, there's non cuttable oh, yeah. plants out there. Yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. But for large portions, it's more more localized. Right. I think too. I mean, if you, it's not economical to harvest if you have, say, the size of this room. You have like 20 plants and something the size of the room. It's not economical to harvest that because there's just not enough there to really be causing a problem. I don't know if that's no. It, what it's part larger of it. sections than that for sure. It's it's mostly if you look at that that tail section of the large lake, right? And towards Benstein, it's basically everything encompassing around Can we that. Jeff, in for a second, and ask his opinion. Yeah, I'm just going to say. Hey, Jeff, Jeff do you have you, any? You, when you went out with the harvester map every time, what did you see? My perception is always. And, and keep in mind, I did this last summer too, mm -hmm. which was my first summer. I, I, my perception was that whatever is marked on the map is an area that's harvestable. In other words, it's stuff that's been treated and the time has gone by far enough and now it's time to remove it. There have been times I've gone out there in the marked areas and found very little weeds. And there's times that I've driven over areas that have not been marked and saw lots of weeds. But my opinion is that I'm leaving it up to the expert to tell me when to do what. Absolutely. Right, but, always but I guess my question was... The time circumstance, I mean, I love, but enough time spent, I've always felt that I've been covering it. In other words, that it, it, it wasn't an issue that I could have needed to spend more time, and if there needed to be, I could have. In other words, I can move my time with another community and add another three, four hours if need be. But there have been several times I've gone out there and spent three hours and come back with a machine three quarters full going through as many areas as I can hit. I mean, there are areas that are marked where sometimes I find zippity do that. Well, let's just define it to the areas that are marked. So the harvester map he's been giving you each time, do you feel in the two days a week you've been pretty much covering the areas that was marked? Um, let's say within a week and a half, I make it all the way Right, because he's only out every three weeks. So between the time that he gives you the yeah, harvest, yeah, so you yeah. feel that you've gone through every area he's marked that needs to be harvested. I feel like it might fill so down I guess you. my only question <laughs> is, is that we need to ensure that the areas that were not marked to be harvested weren't being harvested because of the fact that it was, you know, chemically treated or it was the... That very well could be the case in a lot of... I mean, in reality, it'd be much easier for me to just go out there and if I see a weed, get it. Well, it's a lot more time consuming to... Just Hopscotch. Being and objective on this, I would say that it sounds like we either need two maps, one which is absolutely can't be harvested, and that's that's just right. what we go Maybe with. Everything else is fair game. Right. Or we have two maps, which is what I would lean towards, which is 
ideally harvested, and then another map that says distinguishedly not harvestable. Right, and we did do that on one of the maps once they started harvesting down Penny Arm because it was an area where all the air lines come out of that we wanted to sure. stay away from. Sure. So we did mark that on there, but maybe that would make more sense. Because it sounds like to me that I think maybe uh, we'll call it quarter of our problems, but more likely half of our problems is the is some kind of communication gap. Okay. Yeah, I'm open to suggestions. And we work with a lot of lakes that do harvesting. Not all of them own their own harvester, but when we work with the contractors, um, we typically have residents go out with us when we did the survey, and a lot of times they'll add areas to the map you know, from our map, and as long as it's not milfoil in there, you know, we let them do that. Sure. So there is some flexibility, is what I'm saying. But, right, but, I mean, but I think if we. Okay. So, what are your thoughts on that dual map approach? I mean, what would be better in the cabin of that? I mean, from my perspective, from my perspective, I have a GPS, mm -hmm. and I use the coordinates that are marked. It's not a problem for me to follow the coordinates that there are. I guess my only concern is that I've always felt as though whatever's been marked within a week and a half, I make my, w my way all the way around the lake. You know what I mean? Three days, I can make it all the way around the lake. So some days I've worked five hours, some days I've worked four hours, other days I've worked <coughs> three and a half, but I've kind of taken it as my personal responsibility to make sure I'm making my way around the lake. But it has always been my concern. If I lived on the lake and I'm driving by someone's house, I've had people wave to me. <laughs> and do this yeah, and I'm work. like I'm pointing at my GPS <laughs> and at the paperwork like I can't do that you know what I mean so I take literally what's marked because I think that's the right. best thing for the lake yeah so unless I have other direction that's what well, I'm kind of confused because I mean the whole idea of having you do the survey and what you've always told me John which you beat in my head when I first got on the board was that you can't you cut certain weeds we got to do a targeted approach thing and all that and the whole idea was is I thought that these harvester maps were supposed to take care of all that's what we're paying for I, I think you know one of the things that kind of the aha moment would be if we put the areas that can't be harvested on the same map we can do a different color for the areas that you should stay away from and then put the green you know green and red Excluding the sonar area with the chemical treatments you've done in the last you know the summer how many areas do you think would be sectioned off like in a two-week basis after chemical applications that he wouldn't mm. be able to cut percentage-wise of the lake mm, probably after the first major treatment yeah. I would say maybe 20 to 30 percent of the lake at a given time okay we shouldn't be cut right okay right so then it does sound but to me kind of, of your that, plan it sounds outside to me like of that window everything's free so I guess the question would be better suited to you if we were to provide you with a map that shows uh, exactly where you cannot cut you it would feel comfortable makes moving no everything around that and cutting everything that you see otherwise of course makes right. no difference to me either way right i just like to know what's the plan absolutely you know yeah sense. of course mm -hmm. that makes sense so then you could take yeah. out in that three week span or if we bring the surveys up closer every two weeks you would just go out to one section of the lake hit everything in that section if there wasn't much there you just keep on going and then the next day you'd go out probably start where you left off and just keep going around like in said. reality that might be easier because again there are times where there are sections that are marked and let's say let's say I started at the DNR site for example and I do um, everything okay. to the to the I guess that would be to the east towards towards Oak Island and those little spots there and jog, jog back around and then I come back and go to the uh, with maybe the north side of the lake there mm -hmm. and I hit that one green spot the bigger green spot to the left of the access site and I start through there and what I normally do is take my closest swipe closest to the shore because that's where the weeds are generally the heaviest right. and if I go through there and I get three quarters of the way through and I'm getting zip you know what I mean I'll make one pass and then I'll come back into a second pass I may not do a third pass because it, as it gets deeper it becomes left, less yeah. necessary to cut the weeds that are three feet, four feet down. Right. So I might not spend as much time there. But I guess my point being is that sometimes I have to go through those areas because they are marked. Mm -hmm. Right. So it might be easier to just go to areas that I can't go to and hit everything else that's not marked from that perspective. Spend a moment. I mean, I think uh, we've heard 
time and time again is that you either can't get closer to the docks or or that's not allowed to be closer to the docks but it does involve issues of control too right i mean i can't imagine being on that that animal if you're dealing with 10 knot winds or something for example well, well what i find is that the earlier i get out there in the camera the lake is mm -hmm. and the less the machine is loaded the more nimble it is okay can i use the chalkboard just to illustrate sure sure or the dry erase board i should say just so everybody understands what i do when i was that way maybe i should be different let's say this is the lake shore you're going to get a mic again oh. <laughs> <laughs> i can't tell if it's working or not Let's say this is the lake shore. Okay, here's a dock, here's a dock, here's a dock, here's a dock, here's a dock. Oh, here's somebody's floaty something. Here's somebody's well pump that I'm not sure where it is. Here's another dock, okay? What I generally do is the first pass around is I come as close to the dock as I can. But keep in mind, I got a paddle wheel that sticks out probably four feet. Go like this. Puts me at a tough spot here because I can't really get back in here with one swipe. Okay, that would be my first pass, for example. Then I'll go as long as I can so that it gives time for this to settle down so I can see a little better. But in reality, it's more of a field game than it is a sea game because sure. you can't really see. I'll come back again, do the same thing. Each pass is probably 10 feet wide, nine and a half feet wide. The reason I know that is I put the cover in the back of my truck and it hangs out a foot and a half. <laughs> but anyway, once I do this, then I will put myself in a position where I'll come in here to some degree depending on circumstances. But again, we got a floaty device. Sometimes there's so many obstacles. In a situation like this, you got a dock and a dock. I'm always concerned that the wind's going to blow or I'm going to hit somebody something. I don't want the potential liability of hitting somebody's $100,000 Chris Craft. So I'm always conscious of that. And from my perspective, the machine is designed with a conveyor like this. And Tony saw that, that the machine works better when you're moving in a constant flow. Can you pull in closer to shore and grab weeds and pick them up? Yes, you can. But the heavier the weed, the better the machine works. If you cut lily pads and things like that, they have a tendency to sort of almost fall off the front and end up on someone's beach shore. So that's also a concern as well. But like in the areas where there's a heavy density and there's room in between the docks, you can maneuver in between the docks and get up. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I was with you. I mean, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I rode with another company. I mean, the harvester's a lot more nimble than I think people think, as long as there's a lot of wind. It's not the machine, it's the operator. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is I was told that he was told and directed to only move in a forward motion, say, 10 feet away from the docks. That's what I was told. I don't know. Okay, that's what I was told the first time I brought this up. What we told Jeff is to use his discretion. Okay, so there's no, so you've not been given to any limitations except for what you feel comfortable with the drive. I have, no, I have no limitations. No. Okay. Nathan and I, I talked make sure about we're that. All clear on that. Yeah. Yeah. He says, you know, do what you think is safe, and 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 I do, you know. Yeah, I think we talked about that. Whether that was a historical issue, a liability issue that created this perception that you. No, I only to move in a forward direction, but I think that was clarified. Okay, but now that we got everybody here, yeah, we're on the same page. That's what I'm saying. We're so if we have a up. if we have a villager who calls us and says, "Hey, look, the harvester went by my dock, and he was ten feet away from the dock," or there's like plenty of room in between the docks, and there was a lot of stuff there, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that unless it was a real windy day or something. Yeah. Well, in, in the discretion you have to have. Right. That. Right. And I'll do respect. They may see me ten feet from the dock because I've already gone by twice. No, I understand. I'm talking about what they see, what's cut, though. I mean, you can see after you're done cutting, you know, how far somebody has gone to an area. Within reason, but like Paul said, it's not like cutting the lawn. Right. Some of these weeds, when you go over them, and it depends how fast you go. You know, plow them over. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the type of weed and the density, like the, I, I think it's the, what's the one that's like a carpet? Oh, uh, starry. Star Star yeah, there were certain areas that were so heavy with that that I would go about three feet forward, and I would actually have to stop and pick up the front of the machine, back up, set it back down, and use the paddle wheels from the machine to push it in front of it again so I could pick it up because it was so heavy in certain areas. So it just depends on the type of weed. It depends a lot on the type of weed. In the chair, historically, I was here when we got the first harvester, the second one, and the third. 
the idea was to get as much mass out of the lake as possible. And when you start going in forward into in between docks, when you back up the paddle wheels, all that silt and muck goes into the shoreline. Now you got residents who are irritated about that. So the idea was to try to go in a straight line, get as close as you can. Now if you go to a section where there's maybe no docks or no obstacles to 50 feet, you could swing in a little bit and come out. Chemical was supposed to be used along the shoreline to control the shoreline, egress, and ingress to the, to your, with your boat and swimming. Now the lake is totally chemical dependent. Last year, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we put a whole 60 hours of harvesting in. When we had the harvester, that was 60 hours a week. Now we got nine, big deal. We should be cutting if, as much as we can. And I've even asked him, what does more damage? Cutting milfoil with a harvester that we spend almost $200,000 on that has a real wide spot, blades up and down, rolls everything back, and very little debris for one summer day with all the boats running around in the shallow area, chopping up all that milfoil. Well, we can We've all even admitted that probably the propellers do more damage <coughs> than that. And the whole key to make this lake a better lake was to get the mass out and not let it go down to the bottom and make more bottom. And what do we do? We kill all the lakes, it goes back, all the weeds, they go down to the bottom. We're never going to get ahead because our harvesters are not utilized. Well, I think uh, you heard explanations though, Ed, that there were a couple things that are going on there, and that is one, when we do use chemicals, there are restrictions that you naturally have to implement on terms of- don't use chemicals, put the harvester in there. Well, and Let's go back to the expert as to what would be your explanation, Dad? I mean, I well, just I, I mean, just heard Jeff talking about going in straight paths in front of the houses, he just correct? Jeff? Exactly in between docks. Well, he just admitted that. Yeah. Well, he says he does, but I, I think if you if you go originally the goal was to get the mass out and go in a straight line. What happens if somebody goes in front and John comes or, or whoever's operating? comes in front of Constable and Sinkowitz's house and does it, well, my neighbor's got a small line, he can't get in there. You're going to get a phone call from the, hey, what's the hey, you doing this guy? You know, I, I never so get mine done. The, the thing is, Mr. Mr. Scott, I, I think in reality, can I go between the docks? Yes. But is the machine designed to do that? No. It, no. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's I, I would disagree with you, to. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, I rode with a professional company. I rode on four of those machines with five different operators, and every one of them drove between the docks. Is it the same size? And that's ours? what they did every day. Tony, is it the same size, or is it the it's more a, natural? It's a third fun? smaller than our machine. It's the one. Okay. Right. But, yeah. you know, I mean. I, I think to uh, Ed's point, I think there is a balance between chemicals and mm -hmm. harvesting. Mm -hmm. And it may be different. Each year could be different on when you, I mean, the goal of the treatments is to get rid of, primarily to get rid of the milfoil and to do near shore areas. Those are the two primary goals of the herbicides. But when you use herbicide, where does the debris go from the dead plant? It goes the same place that it would if the plants lived a full life and died at the end of the season. Where does you probably have less. <laughs> What's that? Where does the plant yeah, it's taken out. That's what I'm not saying harvesting is bad. I'm just saying there's certain plants you probably don't want to harvest. And I've seen, if you want to see an example of just using harvesting, there's a lake in Grand Rapids called Reeds Lake where they for years did harvesting. I would never advocate just using harvester. With right. 60 hours a year, 90 hours a year, that's, that's unacceptable. Yeah. And I'm saying, um, Yes, you should try to use as much harvesting as you can with the other limitations. Right, and so just make sure that we all take a step back and look at everything, you know, holistically here, because we just went through about 20 minutes before this of discussing that exact mm -hmm. same point. Mm -hmm. uh, from here on out, moving forward, we're going to create a, a map that Jeff can use and be more strategic in his cutting so that we have uh, areas that he can't touch, and to this point, a lot of us didn't understand um, 
why he wasn't cutting as much, and now it seems to be a miscommunication that we've clarified. So right. now that we'll have a spot where or spots that he can't touch, and now he could cut the rest. And so he will be harvesting more. And so just for a sake of time, we're going to, um, I'd like to get through the rest of your presentation. Yeah, there's only a few more slides. Bit, so, and yep. then we'll open it back up to the public. Yeah. But uh, I just want to make sure that everybody, we are going to be harvesting more. I agree that we aren't harvesting as much as we should have been. I agree too. And uh, there's a lot of frustration here on the board as well. Um, but uh, in my own eyes, this is clarifying quite a bit. It sounds like we had an issue mm -hmm. and, and we're getting past it. Yeah, right. Right. Okay, I'm just gonna continue to go through these. Um, and you'll notice that the treatments as you go on, you know, we're still treating mostly starry stonework down in Penny Arm, and then there's some milfoil springing up in other areas. And then this was the harvest area for the mid-June survey. And then this is the treatment from the mid or late July. Actually, this, I think this treatment, I don't, or yeah, we did a July 13. So this is a mid-July treatment. Um, we're treating, you know, starry down in here. They did a bump up for this area for the sonar one. And then the harvesting, again, we're starting to go down into Penny Arm. This is the first time. Oh, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yep. Last year, I wasn't allowed to go into Penny Lake Arm at all. Right. Yep, we talked about that last year. I just I got to bring right. this up because I'm trying to just be straight up from my mm -hmm. perspective. Sure. I got to tell you, when I went in there finally this year, in two days, I took 11 loads of weeds on Penny Lake Arm. Right. So all due respect, but if the stuff kills it and it goes away, it didn't go away. Right. And the reason we couldn't go in there was because of the limitations we had from the DEQ. As soon as those limitations were up, we went in there. But Which I mean, is, as soon as I got in there this year, I felt bad for the people that lived there. Right. It, that's why the starry stonework is difficult to control with chemicals alone. It's comforting. That's why I say you have to use a combination of harvesting and treatment. So this was the August 3rd treatment. Again, we do another starry stonework treatment down in Penny Arm. But this was where we started to really see a regrowth of not only milfoil, but we started seeing a lot of the naiad, particularly on the, the uh, north, well, I guess it's kind of southwest part of the lake. Uh, something to sure, Ed's point, no, we'll are you. we already kind of only treating the shorelines anyway, kind of? We're not treating the main center of the lake with any chemicals, are we? Not at this point. In but I mean, in the previous applications, it looked like most of our treatments occur yeah. mostly along the shoreline anyway right now. I mean, we're already right. kind of doing what... Right. And then this is the harvesting where we had um, Jeff go down into Penny Arm oh. to open up those areas behind the dock. August 24, this was primarily Nyad areas, which is kind of that lighter green, and there was a few areas of milfoil, and then the harvesting again throughout the lake. We had to wait a little longer in this area, that was the other um, sonar one area. And then, it, like, this is what I was talking about where we have like a no harvest marked on the map, we could do that on every map when we send one to the harvester. So if, if there was a question came up where somebody had a problem, it could be addressed as long as it's not in the, one of those red areas. Um, this is the tracking chart that we put together this year. I just kind of wanted, I'm not going to go into great detail, but it kind of shows what's going on. When you first went out there this year, 80% Basically, 80% of the shoreline had nuisance growth, and it was almost all exotic. The exotic is on the bottom here, the kind of orangish color. And then the nuisance native growth, which is a certain level of growth that we all determined before this season, um, 
basically what it shows is that the first part of the year was all exotic. After that first treatment, exotic growth went way down, but then you start seeing the native growth come up. And what most people care about is the combined of those two. That's why, that's why I put them on top of each other. And you can see that the worst time was right around the 4th of July, which was unfortunate this year. But it did start to get better. Um, but I think next year we expect to have a lot better results <coughs> because of the penny arm being that huge issue. And I, I didn't put this, um, this will be, when we do our report at the end of the year, we'll have the final survey from today. It actually looked better today than it had. I think it was probably down in the range of like 30 today. So. I think the, just from eyeballing it, the, the least amount of complaints we had for most of the lake were in this time period right here where it's kind of below that 40%. I think that's kind of our target. If we can keep things at or below about 40%, I think most people will be happy. And Question. Paul, just to be clear on the, the timing of that, <clears throat> so we had a really high amount of aquatic invasive species until after we were able to do that mid-May treatment. So had we done, had the state actually issued our permit in a timely manner, the way they're legally required to, um, we would have done that treatment much earlier in the season. Right, and we wouldn't have seen nearly so much growth to start the season, right? At least in penny arm, if you wouldn't have, right? Where the sonar one areas. Yep, and I, I did want to show, I alluded to a little bit, the hydroacoustic bio volume. This was the map from, I kind of call these a heat map. Basically, the red and the yellow, if you look at this chart, you probably can't read it, but that's basically the amount of volume, the amount of the total water column that the plants occupy. So the reds are gonna be almost 100% or up to the surface. And this was back in April 19, I think, when we did this. So this is a month before the treatment. And you can see this area down in here was already bad, even at April 19. Mm -hmm. And then over on the west side, there's mm -hmm. a couple areas too where, again, it's in shallow water, so it doesn't take as long for those plants to become a problem. But you can see, even at that point in the year, you could kind of tell there was going to be issues. Um, typically, what you would see in early spring is these green colors throughout the lake. There wouldn't be much red. And then by the end of the season, this was the mid-July or the mid-August survey. And you can see now that it's better down here, but this is mostly starry stone, but the area that was really bad is a lot better. Um, and then you start to see celery, and this is almost all naiad and pond weeds. But you can see that control area that wasn't treated is red. So if, if you wanna see how the lake would look if you didn't do anything to it. You go to that area where the control area is. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of what. Yeah, Paul, that is interesting though, where you use the new sonar chemical yeah. up where I live on the east end of yep. the lake. Yep, there's still a lot of growth, yep. And my experience is in the last month, it's probably the worst it's been. The yeah, there was still, the pond weeds are really thick in there and well, there's milfoil. It's but it's down lower, it's dying. But I think next year we can just go in there and harvest again. <coughs> you know, early in the season and take care of that. Well, you would actually say that this year we could contain harvest, correct? We were waiting until that milfoil went down. Now you could probably go in there and harvest if they so want to do that. Take advantage of the fact that we're in unusually warm September. Yeah, I mean, we could mm -hmm. do it. That, my suggestion, and it was going to come later, and I, I'd still like to hold the questions till we, we finish the presentation. Right. Um, but I would say moving forward that we, we do need to be aggressive in the fact and take advantage of the opportunity that we have to, to harvest through the end of the season. And I would actually, you know, lightly propose, not officially propose just yet, or open the discussion. Maybe if you would suggest it could be advantageous to do more treatments through I don't want to get to April next year and have twice the problems if I could have uh, greatly reduced it towards the end of this year. 
because we're if we're we're trending to be at least as aggressive of a warm year as we had last year, if not more. With the El Nino, right? Yeah. So that would be something I'd like to put out there, but for everybody's sake, so we could get through everything, if you can uh, quickly wrap up. And yep, that's the last slide. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's my daughter. <laughs> okay, uh, hold on a second now. Let's, uh, what we want to do is open it up to, to the public now, right? I think that would be a good idea. Uh, a, motion. a motion to open up to the public, motion. Jen? Okay, second. Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now. Before we get started, when you when you raise your hand and we call on you, stand up, state your name and address, and uh, and use a microphone. I guess, right? You want to use a microphone? Yes. Yeah. Well, we got a hand one, or we can come up here and use this one here. So, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, Tom Mersh, two six five Oak Island. Two things. Why are why a year later we're still talking about this? Uh, all you people were there last November when you had the limologist and you had uh, couple the, the application people. The harvester was supposed to be used a lot more this year. Uh, all this was discussed back then, not what he did, but what we've been talking about for the last hour and 15 minutes, and the harvester hasn't been used. Why has the ball well, from what I understand, from what we were just talking with uh, Sig, is that uh, apparently there was a lack of communication here, and we were, we thought one thing, and if somebody else thought something else, and Jeff thought something else, and it just wasn't uh, wasn't clicking. But now uh, we seem to have things. Uh, I, I think I, I, we're going to have a little motion uh, later on. I'm sure of it to talk about uh, harvesting, but. With the with all the chemicals that they've been using, which I, you know I understand that there's there's issues with that with the chemicals and uh, that people have some issues with the chemicals, but we have to use both the chemicals and the harvester. And with when we ha put the chemicals in the water, we have to hold on hold off with some of them before we harvest them up. I understand that. And and uh, again, a lack of communication between where you think where we thought that. We, where you you where you thought that you couldn't harvest, and in fact you actually could have. So no 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 that's not what I mean. I mean that we didn't have a spot on the map where that you couldn't harvest. Well, no 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 yeah right now I have a spot marked on the map where I can harvest. My point I mean the, the, the yes. issue is that for example not so the majority of this year, I couldn't go into Penny Lake. Right. Right. Of this year, I right. The main lake. Exactly. And that, the that was going to be. Year, I, I did the areas that were marked. Well, I think a key reason that we have the same issue today that we tried to resolve last year was, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, there's a couple things that occurred. First of all, we had all those issues in the end of Penny Lake. Paul went out and looked for the best chemical treatment we could hit it hard and early with, which was the sonar. The original sonar version. Uh, wasn't a granule version, it was a liquid version. So that's why we asked to get the special granular stuff, which was supposed to be better. Yeah. The delay of that permit right there prevented us from harvesting like okay. a third of the lake. That's understood. That's Under, one okay, point. we understand that. It's very I mean, that's a big significant When we part. left here, if you recall, there was probably 90% <coughs> of people were from Penny Lake here last November. Yeah. Crabbing right. about, they couldn't get their boats out, they couldn't, things growing over there. Right. And it looks phenomenal right now. I don't know what it, how the well, shoreline the, is. The sonar, I all right, but right. all right, that's fine. The harvester. The harvester. That's fine. Why does it take a year, though? If you go back last year, everybody walked out of here figuring that you guys had what was had to be done and take it and take the ball and run with it. It's the it's and the, the ball wasn't taken and run with. It, it was actually, and was. so the we we took the the information from the end of last year. We worked with Paul and developed the regimen that we were going to do for the chemical treatments and for eventual. Why harvesting. is the harvester only run eight hours a week? We're. It, you told us last year that the harvester was going to be out more than what it's been out. Had the sonar treatments been applied earlier in the season? I'm just saying that's what you told us. Well, the harvester was going to be used more. I'm telling you the reason. Secondly, was. all right. I live on Oak Island. I know that that Spiley was it. Whatever. Celery. Wild celery. 
whatever it is, has been out there Curly. since June because I have not been able to fish out there and I've been fishing on this lake off my dock for the last 38 years. And I, and John can attest to it, I've been out there nightly. I haven't been out there twice since June with any success at all because every time you put the hook line in the water, all you get is that, that spirally stuff coming up. I agree. And, it's, those, those and the, then the harvester. This year and, and this is what I was raising the issue with Paul for next year, where we have to be prepared because apparently this year the chemical that we had planned on was not available to, okay. to treat. The harvester is going to go out 40 feet from uh, my shoreline because the dock is out 32 feet or whatever it is, the boat's out there. And there's about uh, 80 feet between my dock and the next dock. I feel that he should, I'm not with it, I feel that he should take and back, pull in, push it in. If he has to push it and can't get it all, at least uh, get out there and get it. I'm not going out 40 and 50 feet of water to get uh, weeds. I understand. And, I feel that there, it should be at least pushed in you know, 15, 20 feet from shoreline so that I can get to it. So there's no way I can get it otherwise. I would like to, to table the star stone ward. I have some heartburn on on that subject as well. We need to make sure that we have a, a really good plan for next year because I'm not really convinced that we're going to be able to Thank get you. it if we have a, a chemical issue for next year and we fully reply or rely on on that method. Um, so you know whether it's going to be manual extraction or something of that nature that we have to what i do when when we send them the authorization for them to apply for a permit that we can request that they have a supply of both combing crystal and or harpoon granular so that if they run into this issue next year that we'll let's clarify to something too i think tom we went by today. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of curly leaf palm weed and celery that you're suffering from, not starry stonewort. Okay, you, right. you mentioned it starry was stone. celery, mostly. Mostly celery, yeah. which is a late season plant, correct, <coughs> Paul? I mean, so even early in the season, that wasn't it. Yep. And with Jeff, I, I don't know. You know where you know where he lives, don't you? In the sense, Jeff, it's right off. Uh, if you take the bridge and the front of Oak Island to the lakeside, that's exactly where Tom lives. Um, I know you well, We saw the cutting, actually. Uh, yeah. And I think you were probably within six feet of shoreline before you started to come back out again. So, I don't know how... When you say six feet of shoreline, are you talking about... Sorry. Yeah, you're talking 40 feet out. Well, I'm actually talking as we were looking at it from the edge of the shoreline going out six feet, it looks like what is working. down by the bridge. It couldn't have been in front of the island because he's got all the docks in front of the island. Well, that's not what and we saw. Out, but there, there's, there are three boats out there. And no, all out, we, and were, boats. we were there. We were there. I got it. I'm going to give it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next. Yeah, go ahead. Go down ahead. About, can I talk? Yes, Down to Bothell, 807 Laguna. I'm right on the main portion of the lake, and it's been a very hot summer. And all I'm going by is the postings that have been on my yard that uh, they treated five or six times. And the furthest out date where it says not to water livestock was a week out. So that's six weeks. The lake was out of use as far as I'm concerned. My dog drinks the water. I'm concerned about the chemicals I'm absorbing through my skin. And at a time when everyone's going green, you're dumping all these chemicals in the lake. And I'm very concerned about that. And I don't like it. And I've been here long enough that I've seen a weed harvester out here, the other one too. And it's done a fabulous job. And I'd like to see no chemicals, more harvester. Hi, Walt Saharski. I live at 595 Laguna, and I'd like to see the harvester. He goes by my house every every time he goes out. I'd like to see him have the cutter down when he's headed to an area that he's going to cut, because 
over this past weekend with the boats out there I got 40 feet of weeds in front of my house right now that's from the boats going by all weekend as you can see it it's 40 feet of weeds 50 feet wide and that's after just this holiday weekend I didn't have any on Friday but Saturday Sunday and Monday this is what happened to my house so the boats are cutting up all the weeds on the main traffic area of the lake that's where we need to hit the harvester to stop that from happening All right, a, a couple of things I want, want to go back to. When <laughs> Penny Lake was such a disaster this spring, I don't know why we didn't go, and I suggested the harvesters that we can't cut because we put the chemical in. Well, why didn't we go in there and get as much that we could have harvested before, that application of May whatever, then come in with the chemical, because the worst part of us that the chemical killed the weeds. The weeds had no place to go and they floated there for a month. And the people in Penny Lake have, been get, have gotten the shaft for the last two or three years. Last year, all this aerator stuff went, when it went in, which I think is worthless, and nobody told us that we weren't gonna cut in there. They didn't know, and I didn't hear it at a council meeting, that we wouldn't be cutting in there because we put in the aerators and we had these hoses. All of a sudden, they don't get anything. But getting back to the cutting. We have an operator that is conscientious, does the maintenance and takes care of that $200,000 machine as good as anybody can, and the DPW has, has told me that. The problem is, he's an employee. He doesn't go where he wants to go, or where the neighbors tell him to go, or people give him the high sign as he goes by because he doesn't cut. He's got a map and says go cut there. And I've seen many times where that guy went out and cut, backed up, dropped the weeds off. I walked down there and you could have taken it away with maybe one or two pickup loads. So obviously he was doing his part. Somebody was not doing their part or telling him where to go. And if you put the blade down and you go all the way across the lake, cutting weeds to get to the spot you're supposed to cut, you're, you're never going to get there because you got to turn around and come back and empty. Time to get there too. So it's an ongoing thing. The other thing I wanted to clarify a point, John, you used the word farmland. There's never been any farmland around Wolverine Lake. It's a swamp, it's a peat bog that was flooded and made into a lake. I, I, so, I used the word farmland, I was mistaken. I thought I used okay. marshland. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll let you go on or myself go on that. Sure. All right. And the other thing I'm very thankful for is for years I was complaining about we don't put chemical in on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday and screw up the weekend. And I will say to you that this year I think everybody notices we do a posting on a Friday and do the application Monday, Tuesday so we leave the weekends alone. And I think it's tough because I mean I remember that harvester worked eight to ten hours a day Saturday and Sunday. One person cannot do that. Now either we ask him if he can step up and put in more time but he has other responsibilities to the community that maybe it's time that he gets an understudy or somebody else that can go out there and spend a whole day when he's not available. And I think he would be a very qualified teacher. Can I ask a point on that point, Ed? We came to the council with that and they denied it. Yeah, I know in that <laughs> sense they denied it. We did, but but I thought we had run through a sequence of conversations here that basically said that to do what was just suggested in some sense is not really that efficient. Well, you know, running a blade down the lake to go and not doing a lot of harvesting in terms of the fact that there's not a lot to harvest doesn't necessarily make... No, it becomes I mean, it's a good show, but it's not necessarily an efficient way to operate 
Well, and not to mention that sh machine doesn't travel very mm -hmm. speedily. With so the when if you put the front down to go across 30 feet of water, you're just burning a whole bunch of fuel and beating the machine up and getting a little bit of weeds. Okay. I mean, in reality, you're just skimming whatever's on top of the water. And which, because I, I heard, which know, to some degree, though, uh, there is some heartburn, and I agree with it that we we should be skimming at least at some point where we do have a lot of surface weeds like yeah, um, like, yeah, the like pictures the yeah pictures. but those those pictures that you see are after a weekend with people chopping up props sure. and i would venture to say that prop chop for lack of, lack of a better term is probably from areas that were not supposed to be harvested you know i mean areas that are not on the map to be harvested so you know we have a scenario where i mean to be perfectly blunt there's times i've driven across areas that I can see, man, I'd like to just get into that because it's kind of a drag to be out there for three hours and fill that machine up once. Right. And I'm going across an area where the weeds look just luscious to me. I'd like to get those, but I can't because they're not marked on the map. And and I think we've addressed that for, for future and moving forward because the, I think the direction from the board, uh, loosely, I'm not going to speak for anybody but myself at the moment, is that we are going to uh, distinctly show where you cannot cut and then if you do see areas that are, um, if it's inefficient to have the cutter down, we understand to leave it up in a case where there's little to no weeds. But in a case where there are um, large quantities, then, then we need to be cutting. Yeah, of course. But there's times I'm cutting across the lake to a different area. You know what I'm saying? In other words, it's 30 feet deep and there's just a little handful of weeds for example and, that, and yeah I, I don't think anybody's telling you you should be cutting that right and, and, and as far as the time situation I sincerely believe right now uh, with the plan that's happening that the amount of time that I'm putting in is adequate I know last year there was a point in time around August when Sharon was still here where I would go out there for uh, three hours and come back with a bushel basket full and we kind of just decided at that point, I know some people were aggravated about that, that it was just a complete waste of fuel. And I mean, I was trying so hard to get weeds that I was breaking teeth off on the bottom of the lake because there wasn't anything there in the big portion of the lake. I think we need to be prepared for next year. And I think that if we're going to start harvesting in Penny Lake next year, like we keep saying, that I think we need more than one operator two days a week, or at least have that benefit of having somebody available if we need it. Well, I, mean, I can, I can a truck or something. I mean, we're kind of dead in the water. I mean, the council told me that Andy could step in and do it, but I don't think that's an effective no. backup plan. I, I think I think that's something that you'll have to deal and find out what Jeff is capable. If he can do 40 hours a week, that might be what we need. If he can't. Then you might have to find somebody else. But well, then the problem still remains, though. It's it's a you know, it's not a, a, a twelve month a year job. No, you know, that's right. Getting back to that, again, if if the harvester, what, however this decides, goes in and out a straight line, if a harvester cuts along the edge of a dock, you're not going to have anybody complaining about not being able to get their boat in and out because their boat is next to the dock, they back up and they're on their way. So again, it's not that maneuverable, it's, it's a cumbersome piece of machinery and trying to go in and out. If you can go in and make a sweep, that's fine. And um, the, the other thing I think is, is that, and, and I think Jeff alluded to it, it's more efficient to say, okay, I come out here at the access and I'm going to the left. And I'm going around the lake, I'm working my way around the lake, now I'm coming along Angola, and I'm going this way, and I'm going that way. But to go here, and then go here, that hopscotch, just like he said, that boat is slow, it takes a lot of time to get there, and then what do you get? This way, if he knows the areas he can't cut, and, he, and he's going, working around the lake in whatever direction, and sees weeds, he cuts them and brings them back. And we also have to keep in mind about places to drop the weeds off. That makes it critical where you cut and how you cut. Thank you. <laughs> uh, John McGee, 814 Wolverine Drive. <clears throat> Just had a, a couple questions. And um, first of all, I think we'll find, and council is gonna support, if we wanna do more harvesting, we need more hours, we're gonna find the budget for that. That's, that's not gonna be a problem, and we'll figure out <clears throat> how, that's, how that's done. Um, my general concern is always sort of total amount of biomass we can pull out of the lake with harvesting and putting as few chemicals as we can 
into the lake as we go. So <clears throat> this year I think a couple things happened that made it certainly feel like there was a lot more, a lot more chemical treatment going on and a lot more chemicals were going into the lake. One of which was the very late start that we got due to the, the delay in the state permit. Um, we had more treatments than usual because we had the lake consultant out, you would come out, do a survey, tell us what, what would need doing. If we treat more often, do we end up putting sort of fewer chemicals per treatment in so it's a little bit more targeted and so at the end of the year we get to the end and we look at you know total quantity we put in, do we put less? Ye yes, when they, and to be honest with you, I'd have to look at it in more detail to see if it was more chemical. I mean, I can look at Yeah, I figure we'll, we'll get to the end and we'll, we'll take a look right. at the dollars because and the amounts. And like the Sonar 1 is a very small amount because it's a very <coughs> potent herbicide mm -hmm. so you don't have to put it in. So you can't just look at amounts. Um, we typically look at costs and things like that or acreage. But um, yes, when we're going out more, obviously, we have at least one more additional survey that we did, so there's an additional treatment. Um, it is probably after that first one, the, the treatments were more spot treatments. Um, certain areas probably did, I think the one lady said she got treated like five times or something like that. But that was, it was posted, don't water your livestock for seven days after this treatment. Yeah. It, How many it is. Chemicals am I absorbing through my skin? I don't right. drink in the water. Uh, a half a uh, cup of poison is not better than a full cup. It's still poison. You're still putting chemicals in the water that we all are absorbing. And, and I think that's that's the question that I that I've heard from a lot of people because when we when we post we post you know sort of the same warning around all the shoreline. Right. Yeah, you can get on and take a look at the the treatment map, and if you know what's really going on with that, you might be able to determine you know where where what treatment's going. But I know it, it you know it feels as if boom chemical, boom chemical, boom chemical. So, but I don't I don't honestly know, and probably won't know until right. we add I them up. Did we put more chemicals in this year or fewer chemicals? Right. It, I think from a public relations standpoint and a public impact to the people that use the lake, the least amount of treatments you have, the better. But that's not necessarily the best way to manage a lake because things change rapidly sometimes, specifically when I, I, I think it's going to have to be a point, a point of discussion right. you know, <laughs> as we right. go through and look well, at next maybe, year's plan. Maybe to help clarify, this is just my own take, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The This year was, I won't call it sacrificial, but it was um, uh, less advantageous to the residents due to the future advantageous aspects of the treatments of this year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. In Take particular in Penny Arm. So, yes. so if we use this as kind of our Hail Mary, the rest of the place that we use throughout the rest of the next few years are going to have to be less aggressive, especially if we now have better clarity on using the, the harvester more aggressively and frequently and constructively and I would imagine a combination of more harvesting um, with the aggressive treatments that we've done this year would require less uh, uh, aggressive and or plentiful treatments in the future years. Right. But it, I mean a lot of it as you well know depends on the weather. Absolutely. And you know I don't have any control over nobody here has control over that but we, we want to, I think what's important is to have a, a focus plan and everybody be at least somewhat on board with it so we know what's going to happen. And I think we talked about some things on the boat today about communication mm -hmm. and getting that information out there. I think personally, the more information, I'm one of those people that the more information, the better. Um, that can backfire sometimes, I realize that, but I think in this day and age with the technology that we have and the availability of information that you know to have it out there so people can plan around it is the best way to do it they may not like it but at least they know it's coming we're never gonna get away from the chemical treatment oh I, I I know that I'm just I'm just I'm just I think we need to we need to think about sort of the impact of that relation and the impact of every time we do a treatment you know people are you know they're they're shut down for, for a while um, but but if it if it ends up if more taxes because I'm on the lake and yet there was six weeks 
I could not use it or I did not feel comfortable using it according to the sign she posted. Six weeks during a short season, it was incredibly hot. So, so I, I, I think that's, that's a perception that's out there that I think we do need to, to, to talk about. And we need, to, we need to just look and see, okay, is this really resulting in using fewer chemicals overall, putting less into the lake? Other question I had, uh, just quickly, it sounds like we're not going to do sonar one next year. I know we had the control area Probably that might have had no foil. Because of the, the issue. I think it did work very well mm -hmm. because it was a confined area. The other area was not as well. It was very slow. And we actually had to do three treatments there. We only did two treatments in Penny Arm. So, so maybe not so yeah. suitable in the rest of the way. And that was part of the evaluation was where, you know, can it work in open water? And the answer is not as well. So I don't think we would use it in open water areas. And I don't know if there's areas on the lake right now where I would feel comfortable using it, given the other downsides of that too with mm -hmm. the restrictions and stuff. Okay. All right, thanks. And the major focus of sonar was for uh, milfoil, correct? Correct. Yeah. The long-term, yep, milfoil. A couple quick ones on this, Paul. I'm, I'm hearing from John that we need to have some kind of comparative analysis of how much chemicals were used this year and compared to past years. Is that what you're looking for? That, that's what I think I, 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 I'd, I'd like. That was a I'd fuzzy like conversation because, here. Because I... Oh, I mean, um, j just Dave so I've gotten the, I've gotten the question a lot. Hey, we're putting a ton more chemicals in this year than we've done in previous years. And to be honest, I don't know if it, we've certainly done more treatments in a more compressed time right, period than right, we've done right. in previous years. And the sonar had watering restrictions that we haven't had in this lake in a long time since the last time we did a fluoridone treatment, which was maybe 15 years ago. And that was really a spring fluoridone treatment, so it didn't impact people the same way. Um, but the the, the, the question I have is, so we did more treatments, but did we actually put more chemicals in the lake right. year, year over year, or did we do more treatments, perhaps intercept some problems before they got larger, and do you know, maybe less, less treatment overall? I, I don't know the answer to that, and I'm curious to find out what the answer well, is. The other variable that goes into that equation is the amount of growth. And the amount of growth, amount of weather. It was a very warm, very yeah. sunny year, yeah. And you guys aren't the only one. Almost every lake in the state had more growth than mm -hmm. normal, so. Yeah, and I realize it's gonna vary, vary year, to right. year to year, but I, I, I think it is kind of a generally important question of, you know, if we're putting, if we're doing more treatments, are we doing more treatments and putting a lot more chemicals into the lake, or are we doing more treatments, intercepting problems before they cover a larger area, and as a result, perhaps doing less, putting in fewer total chemicals than we might other otherwise? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'd like to find out. Okay, that was the reason I wanted to extend some conversation on that. The other thing that we're talking about here is toxicity. I mean, the question of using chemicals, the questions of using herbicides. We had discussions uh, down on the lake about that word livestock. Right. And why livestock is compared to, I have to own a dog, and I've got 600 feet in the lake, and he swims every day. I can't keep him out of the water. I have a concern about those things, like everybody I'm sure on the board does. So, can we have some comfort or should we have no comfort that some of the toxicity issues are more that manna of fear than reality? Right, and part of it is with the EPA, when they, they every one of these herbicides that is approved for waters of the U.S. or public trust, what they call public trust waters, which are basically waters of the U.S., every one of those herbicides has to go through a screening process and it generally takes about 15 to 30 years, depending on the herbicide, to be approved. Um, then it has to be approved by DEQ. And with some of the restrictions that they have on there that you see on those signs are put in place based on a study that was done by the EPA. And then with certain aspects of that herbicide, they may call in like the FDA in this case, which is the Food and Drug Administration. The Food and Drug Administration has a much tighter, higher um, scrutiny 
than the EPA does when they approve a herbicide. EPA is basically looking at toxicity, direct toxicity. They do do some chronic toxicity, but it's primarily direct toxicity or what's called acute toxicity. Um, with the FDA, when they become involved, they're looking at not only the acute toxicity, but is it transmitted through um, the milk of, a, of an animal. And so when they're talking about livestock, they're talking about how long it, it takes to metabolize and could it potentially be put in, there could be a byproduct of that herbicide in the milk of a cow or a goat or whatever livestock you want to milk. But that's why those standards are higher for that. It's perfectly safe for a dog to drink the water after the one day swimming restriction. It isn't, you know, if you were drinking milk from that dog, which I don't know who would do that. <laughs> but well, you could have a dog get pregnant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. So yeah, I mean, if your dog is pregnant and, you know, it's nursing babies, then yeah, you probably would wanna keep them out of there for the five days or whatever it is. But if it's, if it's, you know, just a normal dog that's in the water one day, it's the same as it is for humans. We need more study on that issue or more public information. Uh, my name is Deborah Silak and I live at 821, or no, I don't live at 821 anymore. <laughs> I live at 648 Wolverine Drive. 821. Um, okay, I was here in July. Hi guys. I was here in July and I was, I was the only resident that was here. It was me and all these, these guys. <laughs> and then I came in August and then there was a couple more people here so I felt a little better but um, in the meantime uh, when I was here in July I complained about my wild celery and um, I was here last year and complained about my wild celery and I was here the year before that and complained about my wild celery because we never had that before the aerators went in and three years ago the wild celery was out about 30 feet and last year it was out 20 feet and this year it is now at 10 feet from the shore. And it goes from my dock which is on the, would be the west side of my property to my neighbor's dock which is on the east side of her property leaving about 60 feet of water there that is practically unusable. Yes, the boat is there at the dock, and yes, you can back it out, but what about the kayak? What about an inner tube? What about a paddle board? You can't get through that stuff, and you can't get at it. John said, well, you need it. He says, you know, you might want to get one of those big rigs. I have a big rig, but it only just goes so far. And it's a lot of space between those two houses. Now, I know it's not the greater good of the lake, it's just my, these 60 feet of property that I'm talking about. And I understand, yes, we need more harvesting, I agree with that, and yes, we need less chemicals, and I agree with that. So anyway, I got in touch with, with uh, Nate here, and I got in touch with a couple of you other guys, and, and this was forwarded to Paul here. And then finally, at the end of all of this, after I was here in July and the 13th, or oh, for the, whatever that meeting was, um, then I get a thing that says, um, you know, your area is part of an evaluation area, and we're not gonna treat that. Well, thanks a lot. Everybody, you know, I mean, we've got other parts here on the lake that are getting treated for wild celery, and I can't, I can't get out of my, uh, my property. So when does this evaluation end? It, it ended today once we took the oh. survey. <laughs> <laughs> so the harvester can go down. I mean, they can harvest right now down there. Well, but, but if it's between like, the two docks. Right, it might be too close to shore. You know, I mean, it's, so it's, right. um, you know, like I said, I don't like chemicals, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna do it, well, gosh, give me a little bit of it so I can get out of there too, you know, so. Anyway, that's all I have to say. I know that you guys are trying to do your best and you're just people that live on the lake and all that, but um, it is frust very frustrating for all of us. I understand. So, anyway, that's all I have. Anything else? My name is Sandy Janash. I'm at 2 tw 2330 Ventura. 
Um, I live just off the main lake in the canal adjacent to the DNR ac public access. I think somebody I've heard him say it's Alligator Alley. <laughs> um, we do not get the harvester down the canal. Is there a reason? It's not marked. Could it physically fit he through goes everything? Big, oh, I see yeah, I think so. Because we have the big can. cruise ship yes. in there. I mean, okay. Oh yeah, I think yes, it can. Yes, no. <laughs> Is there a reason why? It's not been marked. We have never had you come down. I think the so last. So we have all the nice weeds that you kill with the chemicals, and they just float around. And I think we've been raking and raking and raking, and like the gal here said, I don't have a rake long enough to go out there. It looks like a garbage Actually, I think it was one turn you couldn't make now. Yeah, the, the July the survey the when we did, journal. there was mill foil there in there, so that's why we couldn't. And that right there. in the mouth of the channel, there was mill foil. Okay. We had them treat that. They probably could go in there now. Now you got Nyad in there. Yes, we they do have probably, Nyad. For sure. They could probably harvest that. That was going to ask you, maybe the, you have to get board approval for this, Nathan, but I can put together a map, a harvesting map based on today's survey. I think that would be good. If, mm -hmm. if they had comments that would be in the what we saw today, so you know, that would require them to put together a motion. Yeah, because we sit, I sit out there and watch the harvester go by, and I just do yeah. this. Jeff hasn't been through again. there in a while, but I don't know if he can make it anymore. I've never been through there. He's never been through there. Never. So, I mean, some people have put up, there's uh, two houses, like when you first come in there, an individual put up a uh, boat be a lift on the tight. corner, and there's another one that there's a boat lift on the second turn now that I know when we had the big cruise ship going around there, an 85-footer went through there that one time, that from what I see there now, I don't think you could make it through there today anymore. But if we thought it was beneficial, maybe we could talk to those two neighbors. I mean, if you can't make it through, that's one thing. But yeah. if you can, and it's just you look at it. I'm just saying, don't hear too judge. much up. I mean, you'll look yeah, at it. Yeah, but yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, sir. Again, I'm just following the directions I that I have. I maybe it'd be something that we can look into towards the end of the season when docks are pulled too. Is it 40 we can. Oh, I just heard it's 40 feet wide. Sure, absolutely. Right. No, absolutely. See, it's not only the width of the machine, but the length of the machine. In other words, if you notice where the harvester sits on the machine, yeah. there's more machine behind me than there is in front of me. So there's a concern as well as when you turn, yes. it's got a big butt, for lack of a better term, and it does this. So there's, you've got to kind of watch that too. It'd be easier for me to hit something back here that I don't see than something that I do see. Sure. You know, so okay. not that I can't, I haven't seen it, but I'll... If I get the nod, I'll, dip, I'll definitely do it. Perfect. Because I know there's, there's, there's lists in that on the, what is that, the west side? Yes, you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the corner, and I think there's a lot of them back there where there's no. Yeah, I'm thinking of that second turn. When you first go in there, you take that straight away, and then you go left. Yes. Right. Then that second left, there's a yeah. dock. On, there's now a lift on the, there's a boat that's always parked on the right-hand side. There's a new lift right there in the corner. My 25-foot pontoon boat, I have to do a three-point turn there myself. So I think my 25-foot pontoon boat has a hard time. I would think you would. Yeah. Okay, check it out and see. As long as I don't get any alligators. Exactly. Be careful. There is one I saw one. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, any other comments? Any other questions? Edward Kale, 2340 Ventura. Edward Kale, 2340 Ventura. Um, a year or so ago, you were talking about the Helmsford pump station creating a flow. Uh, because of I'm, uh, for the nutrients or whatever, has anything more been studied on that? Well, uh, it is running, as you know. Oh, it is. Okay, it has great. Been. It was running, yeah, it's running this morning. Uh, the board at one point in time uh, did propose that we ran a pipe uh, down the length as much as we could and, and use, uh, there's some it looks something like a fire hose with a oxygen intake on it so as the water moves it brings oxygen in and direct the flow but uh, I think from an engineering standpoint it was decided that it wasn't the way to go okay so basically the Helmsford well is I don't know what it's throwing out maybe 600 gallons I don't know what you'd probably know that number 600 gallons a minute or some some number of I don't remember I don't remember the number I don't remember the number it's but a, it, it is flowing very canal. fast right now uh, into that canal that but is that is a, that's enough to keep the flow going that Paul was talking about uh, um 
I couldn't guarantee that. I know that when um, I'm trying to remember who on the board went and uh, used the flow meter down there. It wasn't on the board. I think it was Ed. It was Ed and, uh, and then Mark Duff. Mark Duff, and uh, you couldn't. You didn't bring up any measurable. You know, we have a flow meter, so it, it's not really pushing water as much as filling water. So. <clears throat> And we do have some spreadsheets here uh, locked up in that machine if you want to look at those numbers. I think we're uh, something over $18,000 in expenditure of electricity right now to run our augmentation rooms. Wow. Uh, because we're trying to keep the lake as full as possible. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Has it been helpful? Like open I mean have we brought information to you that maybe has enlightened one more the kind of decisions that we have to look at and why we're as frustrated as you and hopefully next season uh, everything that I'm hearing is that the big orange machine is going to be out there with more utilization uh, where it can be utilized and this year also for the remainder and of and the board will discuss whether or not I think I hear even Nathan on on speed for that is uh, for us to motion up I, you have hours available to bring harvester well yeah, okay uh, to motion up one more, one more one public one. yeah oh Jerry Matkowski 670 Wolverine Drive I spent uh, enough time on the phone with a lot of you I've sent emails, I've talked to Nathan. You all know how I feel. I, I guess you can call me Mrs. Anti-Chemical. So for the last couple of weeks, I have spent hours on a phone and Googling uh, chemicals in the lake, Googling sonar. It's amazing how many chemical companies are out there. And like I said, I, I've talked many hours, and, and to condense it for all of you, I just want most of you to know. One of the things that really came out of this was, when you have chemicals in the lake, you shouldn't water your lawn every day. If you see on your lawn you have yellow spots, and if most of your uh, flowers are turning brown at the end, it's because of the chemicals in the lake. Uh, another thing that they said, if you have a veggie garden, if anybody has a veggie garden, do not use lake water to uh, water the vegetables. And you shouldn't eat them. Uh, I asked about kids being, uh, what, what, what could happen with the kids that are in the lake every day, every day? They should be coming out of the water and put immediately into a shower and washed down. They should never stay in the bathing suit it should all be washed in hot water, and even the towels, everything. Dogs, there have been dogs that have gone to veterinarians for uh, hair coming out, and the first thing the veterinarian says is, you live on a lake, and they put chemicals in the lake. Uh, and it was funny that uh, I asked about uh, the concentration of sonar and when you should go in. I said, I told him, I said, well, you know, uh, they told us 30 days and then they came back and said, you can go in 18 days. And the one gentleman said, he laughed and he said, I wouldn't go in that lake for 120 days if you put sonar in there. Uh, Ed brought up uh, removing the weeds laying at the bottom. Those weeds have to come out. I, I, I can't believe you're just letting them all die, go to the bottom of the lake and rot. They, they have to come out because you're never going to get anything done with this lake if you don't. At a time there was a, a very bad sewer spill from Wild Lake when the when the uh, when it broke and it came over uh, South Commerce. Commerce Lake. I wonder if anybody ever followed up on that. I mean, has the water been tested and was that all cleaned up? Yeah. Yeah. Everything, it, it all went out? Okay. okay, I just asked. Uh, another thing is, uh, of course, the use of the harvesters. It's detri detrimental that uh, this harvester has to be in there. And when we started, like Ed said, when we started, the whole reason to have the harvester was to get rid of chemicals and not use as many chemicals because of all the harm that maybe it's not doing today, 
but maybe 20 years from now your kids are going to be sick or you're going to be sick or you're going to have a, a, a brain tumor and wonder why. It just may be chemicals. Like I said, I'm, this is anti-chemical. Sorry about that. I also uh, got a hold of a company here. I'm going to leave this with you that there are alternates to removing muck uh, from the bottom of the lake. And I'm going to leave this with you. You do with it what you want. Uh, new technology, uh, controlling bacteria, and uh, all the nutrients, putting, uh, getting rid of the vegetation growth. Well, whatever it is, you can. It, it's yours to have. And last up, at least, is one of the things that we always wanted to do, and we never saw the dream come true, and that was to buy a smaller weed harvester for the for the purpose of getting around the docks and getting through and getting underneath the uh, bridge, uh, that area, someplace that we could get in and harvest some of these weeds. And I would ask that you would consider this uh, and maybe put it on your agenda that maybe someday we will be able to buy a small weed harvester and get this done. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I know it may not seem like it, but believe it or not, all of us on the board here are just as concerned about the lake as you are. Uh, we are we are doing the best we can, and we are very very concerned. We don't like the idea of 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 the residents not liking to be on the lake or having issues with the lake. We really don't. Um, most of us live on the lake and we don't like it any more than you do. And we're doing our best that we can to try to do it the proper way, do it the, do it the healthy way, uh, so to speak, without chemicals. Um, but in reality, you're going to need some chemicals just because of the type of lake that we are on. You're going to need a harvester. We tried to, we talked about this many, many times about doing away with one or the other. As a matter of fact, when they were going to buy the harvester, we, we were dead set against it. And they said, well, we're going to buy it anyway, and that's the way we did it. And luckily, it's a good thing we did. But uh, because we're going to, we, you need everything. You need all the tools that you can possibly get to, to do a job like this. And again, like Paul was saying too, it's the type of lake that we have. This is not a natural glacier cut lake. This is this has this has particular instances that uh, maybe not all the lakes have, and we're just doing the best that we can with it. You started out with a lot of organic material at the bottom. Yeah, now, right from the get-go. Started out with that, then. That's actually one of the reasons uh, I hate to mention the word aeration. I know it has a lot of negative, yes. negative uh, theory in here or thinking, uh, but uh, attending the last uh, uh, Michigan State uh, sponsored uh, lake management uh, uh, series that was held up in Lake, uh, I mean, up in Boeing City, there's actually three presenters that showed that aeration has made a major difference in doing what we are looking forward to seeing our aeration do, and that's to reduce that muck bottom by turning our lake from anaerobic to aerobic. One thing to know is that out of the 16, if not now 17 lakes, I think that are aerated, we have the wonderful um, honor of being a lake that they're using as a test lake in aeration in the sense that we're restricted to 20 feet or less where our aerators are. So they being the DEQ. They being the DEQ, yeah. And the reason that for that comes from the concern of aeration turning over the lake much more frequently. Penny Lake, in essence, the measurements were we were turning over, Paul, catch me on this number, but I think it was somewhere around once every 290 or for the whole lake, I think. Yeah, the whole lake. Yeah. Well, well, so yep. Let's just call it about once a year. In other words, the volume of the lake would renew itself in a year. And the estimates right now is that we're doing that about once every six days. So you're seeing a lot of changes um, 
moving through Penny Lake that are not really measurable. But one of the negative things that I heard, and it's only only observation, not necessarily proven yet, is that because we're sitting with 26 aerators that are not in the deep holes, but are in a more shallow configuration, we're actually might be causing that phosphorus to be dragged out of the deep holes and be put closer to the shore. And so your board, um, in the spring, with the help hopefully of whoever's going to remain in the seats at the state in terms of state representative and state senators, uh, would like to move, because this is one we've been given at least somewhat of a nod, move to this uh, the DEQ in the state and have our aerators placed where they belong, which is in deep holes. So at this point in time, uh, conceptually it's working. I, uh, there were four pres uh, two presenters up there, uh, each of whom had four lakes uh, that are using aeration and they're not using harvesting and they're using much less chemicals than they used to use and they really have things under control. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on how that goes in terms of aeration. That was the point of getting rid of the muck we were talking about. And this is not the aeration of 20 years ago. This is a completely different re redesign. Sure, and what? Go ahead. Um, the comment was made to me by uh, quite a few people on Penny Lake, and I think of it too, in regards to the aerator. Penny Lake's never been this bad until the aerators came in. And secondly, uh, Paul had a chart that said a map from I can't remember when and a map from now shows that we haven't decreased any or we haven't increased the depth of the water. So apparently, we're not getting rid of any muck. But the point I keep making that doesn't seem to set in is put all the aerators you want, but if every year you kill the weeds with chemical and that decayed vegetation debris goes down the bottom, you're never going to catch up. It's a losing battle. If you're taking more of the, the vegetation out, and just like Jerry said, and you were on the old water board team, the idea was the harvester was our mainstay and the chemical was gonna help. It's completely reserved, just like everybody here has said. It's all chemical and very little harvester. And if we don't change that, we're going backwards, folks. And that's what we've been doing. Yeah, I harvest, like I said, seven days a week, we had a crew out there, but we're, we're to the opposite. 60 hours last year, 90 hours this year. That's a joke. We wasted a lot of money buying that machine if that's all we're going to do. But I, I just want anyway. to bring us back to just recycle the same point that we are going to be utilizing it more. Mm -hmm. that, well, that's the same discussion we had last year. No, brought, it's uh, it's not the same one. Only used 60 hours last year, right? I now. wasn't on the board last okay. year. I'm, I'm not I'm not blaming you. I know I understand. I'm just saying. But I, I'm, I'm going to make sure that that we move through with this. This is something that I feel is important. I think we have a few members on the board that feel that it's important. We will be utilizing it more and more strategically. I'll tell you, Ed, personally, uh, since the moment I got on this board, I've been complaining about the harvester. I know not being, I've been a I, huge advocate. And you know what? Thing. I'm a modern guy. I live on Penny Lake myself. So, and I'm at the part of the Penny Lake that's had the worst disaster this whole thing. And I'm on the board and I've been kind of fighting this whole fight myself also. But in my mindset, after seeing everything that's going on personally, I think that what we need to do next year is one, that instead of doing that survey map where you're telling him where to cut, that we're gonna give him a survey map and said, these are the only places you can't cut. Right. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna go out there and he's gonna cut everywhere he can, where is the, the most growth. And if, in my mind, I think that during prime season, it's gonna take more than two days a week to do that myself. Because I think that this year when I was walking around, there was a lot of areas that could have been done had he been given the go-ahead to just go stir, you know, go crazy. So I think that we need to get prepared to do that. And, 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 uh, yeah, That's one thing. And then the second part of it is, to get to a lot of people's issues about the chemical treatments, you know, the harvester can only get so close. I mean, granted, I believe they can get closer than it can, but it's still not gonna be that tool to get us closer to the shoreline. So we've got one of two options. This lake is a sports lake. We've got people in here that wanna like lay out there at the beach, play with their kids, kayaks, close to water and all that. 
So we've got one or of two options. Either we do chemical treatments on the shoreline or we look at other options. Now, we've had people talk about using a smaller harvester. Smaller harvester is not going to do that. Like I said, I went out to this company, I wrote on different machines. Smaller car harvester is not going to get us into those areas you want to get to. Smaller harvester one time. I know, I was here. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean I've lived here 20 years. I mean, but it's not going to do what we need to do. Well, I looked at some other tools that we've discussed before that I, you know, John and I showed you that one. There's some other tools that might be something we could consider looking at. That's uh, a tool that has a brush that goes up almost to the shoreline and pulls all the weeds up onto its thing that would take it to the area up to where the harvester would work. You know, I think mechanical harvesting or mechanical tools to go up towards the shoreline is more of what we should be looking at to help augment what we're going to do with a harvester. Because I'm a firm believer of the mechanical removal of the stuff is the best thing we can do. Because once we own the equipment, then all we're doing is paying for labor and gas. And I think it's a very cost-effective solution. And I agree with what a lot of people are saying here. Is the more we do the chemical treatment, this is going to kill the stuff and perpetuate the problem. Yes. On the agenda. Well, yes, Jerry. Uh, there was years ago when we had the harvester, because everybody complained about how long it takes the harvester to go from one place to another, uh, and it was on Del Monte, the uh, president. He would he got permission to leave the harvester in front of his house, so that whoever ran the harvester would go to his house and immediately start cutting in that area. And uh, the drop off again was, uh, I, I talked to Nathan, it was an area that I don't know if it's, if it's uh, you can use that area next to the apartments. He used to drop off uh, weeks there. By Penny Lake Apartments? By Penny Lake, no, by the apartments, yeah. yeah. And, and, this, this and they would drop them off, yeah, on Shanghai. No, we do and that there. So uh, I, I'm offering in front of my house. If ever you want to leave the meat harvester in front of my house for Penny Lake, I, I'd be happy to have it there. You don't think drop off spots are an issue, are they? No, no, but but there are some logistics involved. In other words, if you go to the furthest end of the lake and you fill up, I try to plant it so I'm not full at the furthest point from a drop off. Right. So I try to figure that out in my head because in reality, it may take. 15 minutes to get across the lake if that machine's full. I mean, okay, I've had that machine really We shouldn't be doing full. that. I mean, if, you get a dry, if, you're, if you're picking up loads at like the end of Penny Lake and having to go all the way to some area it takes 15 minutes, I'm, I'm, then that, we need to figure that's out That's what I'm saying. I, I, I make sure that that doesn't happen. Oh, okay. I'm saying if you don't plan it correctly, that can happen. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, but, but I guess I want everybody to understand that as far as the time the harvester is used, I can make myself available for more time. Yeah. But at this point in time, I feel under the particular plan that we've been using that the harvester and the time I've used has been sufficient for the direction I've been given. Now, that right. direction needs to change right. or should change. Right. Right. I'd be glad to make that happen. Sure. Yeah, you know? I think everyone sure. agrees. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Oh, that's we're all in sure. agreement. Right. Yeah, years ago when you used to run the harvester full time, they ran it eight hours a day like some of the people were talking. Mm -hmm. At my house at 595 Laguna, after the guy was done running the harvester, I'd pick up load after load after load of weeds that the harvester tore up but wasn't picked up. I hope that if we do run the harvester more, that we don't get it on the shoreline every day because of where my house sits, the wind blows right into my bay. In my bay, you saw the pictures, that's what it looked like years yeah. ago. I used to take mm -hmm. cartload after cartload. The whole front of my house, 80 feet, would be loaded with weeds at the road. Yeah, that doesn't look good. And it's all from the <laughs> harvester or boats. We can tell the difference between the harvester weeds and the boat weeds. The boat weeds are little chopped pieces. The harvester weeds are tore up. So after a week of the harvester running, my house would be loaded with weeds on my deck. I hope that if we run that harvester a lot, and he knows that he can see what's floating in the lake that will please the area when he's done. And I ask that he does that. that. That's the main thing, because what little bit he might see out in the lake when it comes to my shoreline, mm -hmm. I have to carry it to the road. Sure. So I hope like that will be done. We might want to start that Friday pickup again. Right. The weeds, and also we've got, and uh, they're going through all this stuff with these road endings. 
there's no reason why a road in there can't be utilized to dump off weeds. Yeah, Some we have items a, for discussion, both at council yeah. and here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, right. the first question is we have to work with the harvester operator to see if we need more drop-offs. <coughs> right. It again, sounds like we don't from what no, you're saying. No, right now we're fine. But again, if the program should change and become different, right. less weeds, more harvest, right. yeah. then we're going to probably need more spots. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's, I think we're, we're, we've got a plan. We're going we're gonna to do something with it. We're going to get a motion. I'm sure we're going to have the harvesters start doing more and more uh, this year even. So um, we'll, we'll close that. We uh, close the call to the public. Thank you, Jerry. Going to close the call to the public. I have a motion. Did we do that already? No, we Not didn't yet. do that. No. Okay. That's I'll the, make the motion. Second? Second. Yep. All in favor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. All right, let's uh, continue to the next item here. Uh, you want to do the... Uh, uh, before you all leave, we do have results of the survey you took. If you want to take a look at it, they got, they got it. Okay. Oh, good. okay. Good. He good. Gave all right. Hand up. I guess. Uh, well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to seven. Okay. You know, it's going to be fun. Uh, current lake level, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> because reason for that? Well, I think Cliff is dropping the ball on that. What I think. We need to coordinate that with Andy because he does take the measurement himself. Andy, who's here? Director of the uh, DPW. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, moving forward, I can I can arrange to have that taken before okay, your yeah. meeting and we'll have it reported yeah, to you. Have it I know Cliff used to do it, but we, we, we track that pretty regularly. Well, so. Cliff, uh, Cliff, when he re resigned from here, he, he asked if he could if we wanted him to still do it. And we right. said, yeah. Okay. Well, if, is there a reason we even that need on, that? It'd be yeah. better that way. We well, I, I mean, think why that do we even need that. I think people may want to just know the the well, we right we, to the water. I think it's just some measurements. Uh, uh, so more particularly, uh, trying to determine when uh, you we were to. more above our you know the nine eighteen June and July that we wanted to keep it at. Right, because there are areas in the lake. Uh, I happen to be on one of those areas, but the Round Ethel Court, where when we kept the water too high, they were losing ground quickly because they're lowlands. You know, you you sit up. There are areas around the lake, particularly also back but into the marsh. As a body, we don't really have any no. input to all that because <coughs> it's Nathan and the DPW is adjusting the, the pumps yes. and all That's that true. stuff. Well, so true. A, but we were coordinated more in the past. We were also graphing it. Right, but the only question I'm asking is, is do we need to keep that on the agenda every time? Because we seem to be struggling with that every time. Well, to. I think just for if, if uh, Nathan, you're going to collect it, and it has to be collected. Yeah, we can just make a calendar note to do that the week of the meeting and get it to you. Yeah, um, that'd okay. be fun. All right. Uh, next item, noteworthy complaints of the village. I think we yeah. kind of killed that one. Yeah. Um, Water Management Board... Um, uh, schedule calendar. Uh, we've at this point, I think the only thing that we uh, need to do with the from the calendar is the uh, fish stocking. The fish stocking, and that is in our new business. So when's that permit have to be in? Uh, oh, that's another point. Um, well, okay. well, well, okay. The the, 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 the schedule calendar. Uh, I think that's all we ha we have to do on that is the fish stocking. We'll get to that in new business. So I think that that's closing the water management board uh, schedule calendar. Uh, chairperson's report and general communication. I don't think we have anything with that. Survey results. Did you want to uh, do anything with the survey res results? Well, we were going to, in essence, do them on the projector, but since Nathan has handed them all out, I, I, I don't see any reason why. Yeah. We, but yeah. they will be posted uh, without comment. In other words, graph only, won't they, on the water management? Yeah, we can post it online. Um, yeah. You know, we just closed it yesterday. We okay. had three days where nobody had taken it, so we thought it was time to wrap it up and That's get the good, information good to you. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, if you'd like it to be online, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, without the comments again. Is that There's what hundreds of comments. Yeah. Um, some people kind of identified who they are in those comments. So if you want comments, we'll include them. If you don't, we uh, can present it with just the percentage in the graphs. And the percentage. okay. I think, uh, yeah. yeah. I, 
I think to make it public, I think just yeah. a percentage. And if people request the full thing with comments, we yeah. can certainly give it to them if they like. But you say you've got us a package to do these surveys in the future now for larger. We uh, we signed up for with a membership for Survey Monkey um, that's month to month. So we have to renew it every month if we want to keep it. It's, it was like nineteen dollars or eighteen dollars. Um, if you don't sign up, you're limited to only a hundred responses, and we had a hundred. This is a pretty good tool. I actually liked. This because yeah. I gave I, the, I, the I public a quick like opportunity. Yes. I know a lot of people that I told about it. They just got their cell phone and did it real mm -hmm. quick. And I, I think it could be beneficial for the you know the whole village because Parks and Rec may have a need for a survey. Council exactly. may have a need. I, I, so we're planning to keep that membership. If we go several months without using it, we'll cancel and reestablish yeah. it later. Well, I think but it's a, you know just like anything else, I think it's a gr I think it's a good tool. And if you use it as a tool and not the you know end, end of all means here you know type of thing, I think we'll. I think it's a very beneficial thing. Well, there were a couple common themes running through the comments, and Paul discussed earlier one that we think we can satisfactorily address: the the pre-scheduling of the surveys and yes. getting that out. Yeah. That was something that maybe came up as much as anything. Yeah. So, uh, definitely got some good feedback from it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, okay. Next item: fish stocking. Now. I understand that, well, ev every other year we order either walleye or bait, uh, bait fish, right? Well, actually, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, coming out of Barnschneider, Jeffrey from the DNR, it was a three year cycle. So I, well, think three year cycle? I think what we'll have to do is take a look at that. Um, that was two. My recollection is that it's every other year is walleye. Huh? That's, that's the main thing because we have the opportunity to do other things that we've done bait fish in, in other years just to sort of supplement the general food yeah. of, the, of the lake. But the big one is the walleye. But it's every it's every two years. And the reason is if you do it every year, the one class right. eats the class that comes right. in. But then right. two years later, they're big enough that they don't worry about the little ones so much. So. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was, I thought it was every other year we did the walleye. Do we have a fish count? Well, I know that we want to do the walleye this year. Pretty sure of it. We had a fish survey about oh. three or four years. Yeah. Every 10 years? Yeah, they do it every 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got to just go by that last, the last survey we did. The kind of plan is just kind of based on that initial survey year by year, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that what the... Uh, well, I, I, if the board wants to... Uh, move and, and adopt a fish stocking for two thousand dollars. Let's yeah. make a motion. Yes. Let's make a walleye. Uh, make a I walleye. have a different recollection, but that's fine. We can. When's the permit got to be in? Do we have to decide this meeting? I think. Uh, I think isn't so, it? Because uh, okay. yes, the stocks are going to start to run. Pretty right. Well, so right. Yeah. right. And Nathan. Nathan okay. actually has to get on on the ball and. and so do you know so what? Can, so do we know what size we need? We're for walleye this this year. Yeah. No, I think we are due for walleye. Yeah. I'm. I'm um, just. Yeah, I like we'll, walleye. We'll uh, exchange the notes <laughs> later on. Yeah. Really yeah. About yeah. The I it doing walleye is not going to hurt. About twenty five hundred bucks, right? Yes. Right. That's what we've been doing lately. So we got a motion. Yes, we have a motion for. Uh, I'll make a motion that we uh, what release twenty five hundred dollars in yep. funds for the stocking of, of the fish, walleye. and we'll leave it up to Nathan to ensure that it's the right Proper height species right. and go. size. Second. Uh, Favor. Aye. 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 You have to do. Any nose? So Nathan. Uh, so roll, roll, roll call for money, by the way. Oh, oh. oh yeah, I'm sorry, forgot the roll call. Go ahead. Whiskey. Yep. Uma. Yes. Jameson. Yep. Scott. Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. Uh, fish uh, fish stock. Now, uh, Nathan, so I think you have to, because uh, you hadn't done this before yet, so so you have to get on the horn and, yeah. and uh, get a hold of the people. Yeah, I, and, I don't, uh, I think it's doable now that your motion's been made. It'll go to council next week and we'll get on it right away. Okay, good, good. Okay. Uh, next item is, uh, and, and by request actually, <laughs> Fragmite uh, treatments. Yeah, it really came from Linda. It came from a conversation with Zoner uh, based upon what they're doing in Commerce. Uh, Nathan was kind enough to follow up on that. We talked uh, yeah. on the boat about it. Uh, Commerce, well, the idea was they're, they're, they have a particular. Uh, company that's doing Fragmite chemical treatments and it's working, uh, if we join them we would save money. Nathan has investigated that invitation. It isn't open 
and uh, Steve, who is of aqua weed, has come forward and said that they can do a treatment equal to what I guess uh, Commerce might be doing. So yeah, and I, pick it up. I thought we would have some uh, some discussion on that tonight. Steve isn't isn't here at the moment. On exactly what they have, but I can get more information for you okay. and add it back to the agenda if you like. Uh, first thing in October, sure. and yeah, we'll just leave that. Sure. Yeah, leave that back. We'll leave that on our new business uh, for yeah. next month. Next okay, uh, a few uh, continuing business items: uh, water lake quality discussion. I don't really think we have anything on that, do we? I don't think anything to add to it right now. No. Okay, uh, lake enforcement issues. I don't think there's any issues on that right now. Have you heard anything on that? No? All right, uh, lake aeration and augmentation well oxygenation. Well, we never got those pictures, have we? Those are some big words. What? John? What? Hmm. We never got any pictures from those guys, did we? No, we didn't. Actually, Nathan and I talked about that out on the survey today that, uh, that our boys uh, at the pond uh, group have really fallen down. Uh, there's been at least two emails to them requesting pictures for those heads yeah. and they just aren't coming forward. Now when I was on the lake, uh, when we were doing the survey, Nathan and I were trying to keep an eye open for boils and I didn't see the number of boils that I thought I should be seeing. I thought right. I counted 18. I I no, there's a couple that are missing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's more and, missing. And, and the, the volume is pretty low. Yeah, and Nathan, you said they were out last weekend to adjust heads and fix lines? They had right? to fix a line about two weeks ago, and um, they did that, and I, I was under the impression that everything was functioning properly. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that they did a full like check. They may have just looked at the one that they were there to fix. But um, I can ask again for the the photos you're talking about. But we've seen nothing come into the office one yet. One thing that might be worth our time. I don't know if we can have Nathan do it or one of us. But uh, when I did the research on those pumps, they said they need to be rebuilt after so many hours. I yeah, would like to know correct. outside on our own what that recommended time is for them to be rebuilt. Yeah, because Nathan, I think uh, that what's happened is is now that we're into what the second season. Yeah, two and a half actually. That I think I that know. the reason that we're seeing a big degradation from what we initially saw is because the pumps are starting to fail. Yeah, and when I was uh, in in Boynton uh, at that meeting, uh, the vice president of Veramax, who makes those pumps, was there and said that they had a three-quarter horse. They had been in a discussion with the pond guys about what they should be doing to coordinate maybe upgrades or review and the pond guys are sort of dropping off the map. And I know when we were, when we were out, I was asking whether or not we can add the uh, location of the aerators. Uh, yeah, you don't need another task, but uh, yeah, we, know, if we do a GPS add-on to your GPS map, I mean, right. you're out there, I, it wouldn't be any more of a difficult item than to go by and see if the boils are there. Uh, right, we or can not add there. those, we've got um, map that shows the location yeah, so okay. i think we can get them covered more frequently through paul's work but yeah. i want to make a call to air max and go up they're actually um i was almost going to say mount clemens but they're in that area i mean they're not that far away yeah i talked to their sales manager yeah so uh any, if you if the board would like me to do i'll get a hold of them and see that if Jeff we just can't yeah. up Jeff's no there was a lady that i talked to okay. and was it jeff that was at boyne yeah. or yeah, yeah so okay. any water, uh, winter treatment of the pumps or whatever has to happen over the winter, make sure that we're not. Yeah, they actually remove the pumps. Actually, right, yeah. but the storage of them. Oh. So we need to make sure just coming from an equipment background, storage of the equipment is just as important as the right. as the, the usage and the maintenance. Yeah, yeah so if they're not gonna they're not gonna deal with it. Then if they're wet and it. they freeze and they start cracking seals or whatever it is that makes them less efficient. Yeah. You know, yeah. we just now, are we going to gonna sure take another following. stab at trying to get those things placed deeper? Because as far as when well, I'm that's concerned, what, everything I'm hearing... That's what is, I said earlier. I got to that, figure out, I mean, not on my own, but in cooperation with the board and the council to uh, to reach out to uh, the pond guys again and, and see what's going on with, Bless you. with what they're supposedly doing, which is also trying to spear out their movement. But I... I don't have a high degree of confidence that that's what's going on. So I would, I would suggest, and maybe this could turn into a motion that we start bringing. I mean, Paul's been good enough to come from Grand Rapids. I think we could bring the pond guys in to have to sit through our meetings as well. We'll put them at the end of the meeting too, so that they. 
really want to see if we don't get it like, done. <laughs> invite them out yeah, to our next meeting. Show yeah. them, right? I, I mean, they they should be here, hold them accountable for what we're yeah, trying to do. Yeah, I, I mean, emails and I phone thought he calls. was gonna. I, actually, I thought wasn't he supposed to be here? No, Steve was supposed to be here. I, mean, asked, I knew Steve was going to. Steve did say that he has a friend in the hospital that he was visiting. Oh, so, okay. But, right. Yeah, he was out at the lake today taking okay. samples. Uh, list of training classes, or are you still working on that stuff? I have uh, made some progress, but I haven't okay. put a lot of time. You know what I was going to suggest, Remember, John? it's an idea here that as we get more equipment. Right. Uh, what I was going to suggest, I think the first one that we should do is something about chemicals. <laughs> yeah, no, I seriously, I, I think right, we yeah. should have somebody who really knows because there's a lot of concern in the community about the chemical I, stuff, and I, I think I, the first one of those videos things we should I do is an education about the. I agree with you. I think the urban legend. Yep. yep. Uh, weed survey ride-alongs. Are we doing any more of those? Uh, probably not this year. Probably right? not this year. Okay. But we'll we'll get the one of the things we'll put together this winter. I don't know exactly what month, but we'll have the schedule for surveys ahead of time. Post that. Okay. A comment on that that Excel spreadsheet that I gave you to fill out. I really like oh, that. I think yep, it's. Yeah. I think you did a phenomenal job. Oh yeah. That. And I, I think that. that. that's going to be very beneficial as the years go on because I was I was looking at some of these survey dates and what yep. type and the density of what the weeds were and then I went and I looked at your application map and harvester map and coordinated how successful we were in some areas right. other areas yeah. where we weren't. Yeah. I think it's going to be a very good indicator when we have people come in and complain and say well it's worse this year or last year or whatever now we're going to have the actual statistical information in front right. of us exactly. to really we'll have that right address there. it because I think sometimes people's perception is different than what the reality is. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, I agree. we'll <laughs> put that as an appendix in the report to yeah. the yearly Yeah report. I think it's a great idea. Okay. They've done a fantastic job, and I'm really pleased with that. Yeah, and even Nathan and I were talking about on the uh, spreadsheet on complaints to uh, get as many addresses as possible so that we can go back and resort by address to see where these complaints are getting, mm. you know, in coordination with the, uh, the map that you've been responsible for getting off the ground yep. here. Yep, so. absolutely. Uh, harvesting and ride-alongs. As a matter of fact, I think that's probably a real good time for us to decide what are we going to do with uh, with your harvest. Or Seven o'clock in the morning. What are what are the or do we have benefits at the end of the season here of cutting that would help us for next year? Yeah, I think they do. do for native plants. Yeah, I think they're, they're starting to be You're taking out the biomass. Okay, so as of right now today, since the, the solar stuff's lifted, could you give us a map? Is there any place right now where he can't cut? Probably not in the control area. I wouldn't cut in there. Okay, so the that. only place in the whole lake right now that he can't cut is in that control area. Right. So could we just okay. send him loose now, right? Yeah. And just let you go out there and just hit wherever he sees the if worst stuff. If you see weeds, call just go up. nuts. That's okay. fine. That's okay. great. Have a yeah, field day. That shows where the control. <laughs> area. I know where the control area <laughs> yeah. is on the end. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In the middle. Yep. Do we need to order you some more? Where were the yellow spots? Now, do we yeah. know the area that was the worst <laughs> that people yeah, are complaining about right now? Because I know pretty quickly. Uh, uh, is there any particular you, areas? Uh, he, uh, I think I think the president of the council. Has <laughs> right by your house. In front of his a house. Suggestion, just in terms of uh, a map, which you probably want is some sort of prioritized area. Areas. Hey, these are the worst. Get them first. Right. Which these is, are the areas you can't go, uh, and then everything else is the harvester's right. discretion. Yeah. Right. So you know, I, I think Paul yeah. probably yeah. put it, that it, together it, for yeah. you in terms of where the really bad spots are right now. Hit those first. I would recommend hit those in Penny Lake first. I already know where they are. Yeah. I, 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 you, know, I, I, you know where they're at. I know where they're at. I know. No, but at. I th I think that that's I think that that's perfect. What you just said is that you know like we, you're talking about the the map of having the areas where he shouldn't be harvesting. Right. And then there's on, maybe on even on the same map, different color. Right. The the areas that are prioritized. That definitely right. you want you definitely want to get these. Everything else is his discretion. I don't think we should do that. I think it should be, this is just the area that we don't need to do, and we should have enough labor to go out and just kill it I every week. Uh, let, I, I, I know what's going You know what I'm yeah. saying? I know. You know you, you're on the lake. You, yeah. know what, yeah. what, you know what needs to be done. Exactly. Yeah. We don't need any motion because of budget yeah. issues or anything. Right. Right. No. right. I don't think so. so I okay, so that that's what we're going to do. Right? Okay. You might want to make a motion yeah, to, to, to continue harvesting as late into the season as, as possible. possible. Yes, right. okay. Yeah. I think that's and then council can just can just approve extending that budget okay. if we need to. I don't even know that we need to. Okay, if we're making this change at this point, hey, John, what what I will do tomorrow yeah, is we'll harvest touch, like yeah, four hours, and then on Friday mm -hmm. I will move my time with Wall Lake. Okay. Instead of going okay. in in the morning with them, I will come here in the morning. 
and do another four hours. So that's a third more every week at this point. Okay. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. logical? Yes. Yep. And I think that'll keep us caught. You know, that'll keep us caught up. And let's okay. let's go ahead and and that sounds great. But go ahead and give uh, whoever you're. We'll, oh. we'll do the motion, but also if you're noticing that you are running out of time or that you might need some kind of shift. You know, let's not wait until the next meeting. Right, yeah. Hey, thanks, Paul. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Just let us know as, as you go if, if you need more time or, or what yeah, you Yeah, if you need more time, get get with Nathan. Yeah, I understand that, but I, you have to understand I work for another community. Sure, right. I understand that, yes. You know, yes. In, yes. A, in all due respect, I can't throw everything else away for well, something that's so. going to end in uh, yes. September. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. no, I understand. <coughs> but, uh, so, motion to extend October. harvesting through the latest harvestable part of 2016. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, takes care of that. Website. Do we have anything on the website? I think he's been doing great on the website. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Mr. Social yeah. Media. Um, yeah. But one of the good things about the survey, about 80% of people said they are using the website yeah. Yeah. to get lake related information. That's so that good. was one of the positives. At least 80% um, of the 194 people that we have. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's not a huge sample size, but it's it's probably reflective of, of a larger group of people. So I think that was good. And if you ever see things you think we should be adding, just let me know. Um, Tabitha and I have been working really well together to try to keep that updated okay. as much as we can. All right. Uh, Liaison reports, Village Council. Unfortunately, I was out of town for what? the last meeting. Do I ask the president? He was here. No. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it was road endings, right? I think, uh, yeah, road ending mm -hmm. stuff. Mr. Uh, president, Council President? Um, I, I was out of town. I did not come prepared. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. it's the same way. Uh, uh, yeah. um, probably the biggest thing of interest to the Water Board, uh, not discussed here, is oh, sorry. working. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Uh, probably biggest thing of interest, of immediate interest to the Water Board, um, not already discussed here tonight, is road endings. We're continuing to work through the process of surveys, of finding out where there have been encroachments. Um, there have been quite a few. In general, it's been fairly inadvertent because they haven't been marked really well. Um, there has definitely been a little bit of errant construction. So uh, the administrator has been working with the, you know, the administrate the administrative committee reviewed them all, walked them all, um, went over the surveys, made some recommendations back to council. Now the administrator's been working with individual homeowners so that we can grant either easements or license where it's where it's logical or ask them to move things that have been placed on, on the road endings mm -hmm. if that's, that's the more sensible thing. Uh, what we're also hoping to do is get the signs out. Actually, I haven't, I haven't asked, do we have the signs? So, so we are going to have signs at each of the road endings that we know about that are, you know, just kind of briefly going to identify it. This is a Wolverine Lake road ending. It gives the rules for road endings. Here's what you can do. It's for access and egress to the lake. Um, you can come in. You can come out. There are certain things that you can't do. You can't use a motor vehicle to launch a, launch a boat there. Um, a couple other things. No alcohol, I know, is one of them. Um, no camping? <laughs> on the road ending, I'm not. <laughs> no camping is one of them. <laughs> um, but but anyways, hopefully that's going to make where the road endings are, what you can do on them, what you can't do on them, what you should do on them, what you shouldn't do on them, a lot clearer to everybody, and we won't see so much friction going forward. I think at this point there there were a couple more of the ones that we've identified so far that had some legal complications we have to do a little bit more research into. Um, for better or worse, all of them have been platted differently, have different histories, have different different things associated with them. So we're going going to get a little bit more from information on that, I think, at our next admin committee meeting. But I'm, I'm really kind of hoping that by the end of this year, we will have gotten through this. We'll have them all clearly marked. We'll have a good understanding around them. And I can't guarantee there won't be friction around road endings in the future, but hopefully, hopefully it'll be a lot clearer, on, a lot more clearly understood by everybody, and I think it'll be less of a source of friction than it's been in the past. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's the big item for water board that I can recall. I was just going to say, throwing back to what Ed was talking about, using road endings as possible dumping areas. I think that that would not be really a recommended thing yeah, because you need so. to be able to take the dump truck down and the dump truck back, yeah. and most of those road endings are basically lawns. So they're really not suitable for that sort of thing. Okay. Are, are lawn tractors allowed on those, or will they be when they're 
posted. Yeah, I think lawn tractors. I, uh, um, I believe the restriction is actually motor vehicles in the state motor vehicle sense. So, you know, like license motor vehicle. Okay. <laughs> AT ATV going in and out. Snowmobiles going in and out in the winter is going to be okay. Um, there are restrictions around how late you can do that. Um, so, uh, you know, basically we're, try we're trying to encourage everybody to be good neighbors to everybody mm -hmm. else. Right, great. Thank you. <clears throat> I had a thought and you know how getting old is. Okay, never mind. There, there may have been other things, <laughs> but that, that's the one that I re recall from the meeting that was probably of direct interest. That's it for you? Okay, is that it for you? <laughs> okay, well, for the Planning Commission did not have their meeting again, and so um, I don't have anything to report on that. As a matter of fact, there's, they need to have the next three meetings. So they've only got four months, and they have to have three meetings. So better get on. Again. Better get on. Hey, I'm not, I'm not the, the chair on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, comments from the water mem uh, board members. I think it was a great meeting. I think uh, it was very informal for a lot of people. I think it was, yes, uh, I think it I was think that, you know, Jeffrey we had those issues with the sonar this year, but I'm really excited that next year that I think that we're right. going to have, hopefully, that season that people would like to see. <laughs> you know, if if everything works out the way that we, we, we're hoping they work out, I think a lot of people will be very happy that this was a bad year, but hopefully the rest the next year's will be very Hail Mary year. So, no. yeah, Hail Mary year. <laughs> All right, we have a motion to adjourn. Second. You got it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Good night, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen.